hearing of PC9, um, day seven, I think it is. So, um, <clears throat> Ms. Mardani, you have a, a point to make. Yes, it was just in relation to the site visits, which I understand are to um, be recommenced this afternoon. We've yeah. prepared a, um, a set of the uh, HHA maps with some street addresses um, shown um, to depict the extremities and, and sort of corners. You know, there's, there's only so much you can do without becoming a little useless. But so yeah. we've, we've produced um, updated maps with street addresses, which we'll I'll hand to you now. And if you can have a look at those, and if you think that's helpful, we'll make up um, more copies for <coughs> later in the day. Yes. Um, and then the other point I just wanted to um, test with you is whether you um, felt that there was could be benefit in um, Mr. Not attending the site visits. Now, mm -hmm. there's obvious issues, procedural issues mm -hmm. that, that, um, that, that, that arise, um, which can be managed, um, I'm sure. Um, but I'll just leave it with you, perhaps, yes. to have a yes. think about that uh, Mr. Knott would be available if you think it would assist you. As much as anything, just to understand the edges of the, and, and, and the, um, the, the boundaries of the HHAs, mm -hmm. um, obviously, um, he wouldn't be there to give evidence yeah. or yeah. Um, advocate or, or anything of that nature. It would just be about providing you with information that you request to better understand the HHAs. So he's available to assist in that regard if that's something that you want to um, pursue. <coughs> right, thank you, Mr. Mordain. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the offer. We'll talk about that over the morning break and let you know. Um, <coughs> and I have no doubt this will be useful. But again, we'll. <coughs> We'll uh, review that over the morning tea. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any any matters anybody wants to raise? Please? All right. Well, in that case, let's uh, take our first uh, submitter for today. And uh, Miss Walsh is on the line. I understand, Miss Walsh. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Can you hear me? Right. Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. So uh, uh, okay. proceed and tell us what you want to tell us. Okay. okay and we're going. To, we, well, I understand we're going to Oxford Street. Yes, we are, yes. My name is Susan Walsh and I live at 33 Oxford Street, Fairfield, Kirikiriroa. I'm here as a face of the average homeowner of the City Council's new historic heritage areas. I purchased my 1925 82 square metre home in 2017. Since purchasing, it, I have tried to make it warm by putting in a fireplace, carpeted, re-roofed, painted, and put a high fence and electric gate in, as there have been approximately three burglaries and two attempted burglaries in my area or in my home in the last 10 years. Three of those incidents since I've owned my home, but problems since, no problems since putting in my high gate. I was very happy in my first home until last year a letter arrived in my letterbox to say my place was now under the umbrella of the new proposed heritage area. Although I'm not entirely against heritage areas, what I have learned since about owning a heritage home has totally changed my mind. I will now outline some of those reasons. To start with, I understand the reason Kiri Kiriroa City Council want heritage homes in the city is to have a history of the development of the area. While that is commendable, it has not been the case for Oxford Street. The information being put forward about the seven homes classed as heritage on Oxford Street and five on Marshall Street keep changing. In 2022, my house was in the heritage area because it was supposedly railway housing. Then in March 2023, it was because it was an Alison Bernan prefabricated housing. Then on Monday afternoon, Mr. Knox said it was some other Alison Bernan housing. What is coming next and why? If there is a strong heritage, historic heritage values, couldn't the experts identify my housing typology correctly the first time? The information the council is putting forward about each heritage home needs to be factual and correct, otherwise this is false information and contributing more lies about Aotearoa's history that I grew up with. Secondly, having your home labelled 
a heritage homes means you are disadvantaged as a heritage, as a homeowner. As I stated, my home is 82 square metres and I have a 750 square metre section. I'm 68 years old and I bought my home with the knowledge I could do something with my section to help cater for looking after myself in my later years. And yes, I can still do that, but not without another layer of compliance and cost the council has now put onto my home that other homeowners do not have to bear. Bearing a heritage home also adds a lot of more constraints around what I can do to my home. It does not allow me to fully utilise my asset. This is totally not okay, and it's not fair or reasonable. The council does not have the right to just decide that they will do to my property, especially if this puts costs and constraints on my asset. This is economic discrimination. Since having my home labelled as a heritage home, you have removed some of the joy and security I had since purchasing my home. I now have added costs if I want to make alterations and major constraints as to how I can do that. If I decided to sell my home with a heritage label, the pool of buyers interested would have decreased, as buyers purchasing a property like mine generally want to make to buy my place largely to add on to it, to make it more of a family home, as I have a good side section to cater for children and for today's standards, my home is far too small for a comfortable family dwelling. And because of this, would also probably mean a decrease in price for the sale of my home. My home is my retirement fund and I still have a mortgage, although I'm still working. I need to maximise my asset the best I can. My home is not flash, but it is my security and my only asset for my retirement. But the council have just made my retirement even more constrained. My intention to capitalise on the sale of my house has decreased immensely and has made the possibility of my being able to buy into a retirement village unlikely. This is once again not fair or reasonable. There needs to be a human face to the council's ideology. It cannot just be an academic process as this heritage quest is freezing some people's assets and lives. If the council must preserve the history of the development of Kirikiriroa, then it should not be able to just decide on a policy that has huge repercussions for some of the people living in the city who have now been pulled under the heritage umbrella. The burden of this heritage idea should not be at the cost of the heritage homeowner, and it appears that quite a few of the heritage zones are in the lower socioeconomic area of the city, including mine, with the homeowners least able to afford extra costs and possible devaluation of their properties. Compensation for losses to home values and the extra layer of compliance that comes with the heritage homes must be made by the council, not the homeowner. To finish, I want the Hamilton City Council to remove my home and the others in Oxford Street from the historic heritage area. The City Council's process is flawed and the information you are putting out about the history of my area is incorrect. As I've said before, this is not a fair or reasonable process for the home owners who have been caught in the web of the historic heritage areas. Nā mihi. Kiri kiri roa. City Council, this is not the legacy you want to be remembered for. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Um, questions? No, I've got the questions. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> no questions for you, uh, Ms. Walsh. We've uh, obviously heard uh, from a number of, uh, of interested parties with respect to Oxford Street, and we've got more on, on today. So <coughs> thank you for your contribution to that consideration. Thank you for hearing me. Uh, 
uh, David White and uh, Jean Dorrell. You have provided us with a, a, a substantial amount of material. You're not going to take us all through that, obviously, uh, this morning. Um, I'm, I got your material, uh, your latest material, the first thing this morning, um, and uh, have had a uh, certainly had a look through the two statements. I think that you're probably going to read. Um, you asked for half an hour. You've got half an hour, um, and a little bit more for questions. So, if you could tailor yourself for that, that would be appreciated. Yep. Thank you very much. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, as it was just suggested, we don't need to go through the submissions that we've already made, which include the first submission to rebut the fact that we were railway cottages. Um, we then made two other submissions, one basically in support of a lot of other submitters who were raising some of the same issues that we've yes. raised. Yes. Um, and then we asked to put in a rebuttal when we suddenly found that Mr Knott had changed his mind. Apparently we were no longer railway cottages, we were strong similarity to railway cottages and Alison Barnard housing, prefabricated housing. So we then had to rebut that suggestion, yeah. which I believe we have done. Anyway, I'll just <clears throat> and, and let, let, let me just go to the back end of your of your uh, um, your oral submission, where <clears throat> where you you've requested uh, an opportunity to rebut what happens next. <clears throat> let me just say that's not that's not part of the process. You don't have that option. Just so just that you're aware of that at the beginning yep. of your no, submission. That's, that's fine. Yep. I yep. asked, and you yep. said no, and that's yep. fine. <clears throat> yep. The that's only one who gets to reply is the proponent in this case. So, yeah. Yep. So if we have to rebut anything further, we can do you it do it now. appeal. Yes. Oh, well, week. yes. Because yes. we don't know what other people right. later are going to say. Right, right. <clears throat> yes, I mean, you'll appreciate that if we, we kept on allowing that to happen, we would never finish. Yep, I, <clears> I, I, we, I agree, and that's what we feel like at the moment, because yep. we started off being a railway cottage yep. suburb, and then suddenly we're a different sort of housing. Mm. And mm. it's just been a succession, mm. succession. Mm. and um, I believe on after number 23 did their submission, mm. um, Mr. Not tried to say that we weren't prefabricated Ellison Barnard houses. So all the information that's been put out about this HHA in Oxford and Marshall Street seems to be untrue. It's not correct, so well, how you, can an HHA be erected? And you're giving us the truth now, so well, away you go. Uh, hopefully I am. <laughs> right. right. Mr Miller's report in Central 8D state that the houses in Oxford Street East all have central front doors with symmetric windows on either side. In Mr Knott's oral presentation at the end of the 29th of May, after viewing pictures showing that only two of the seven Oxford Street houses had this features, he states he meant that they had them in the past, and he can see this in the historic aerial photo. So Mr Knott is not actually assessing the houses as found. In a report prepared by Adam Wilde, Director of Artefact, on the demolition of the municipal pools, he states the following, and I can read that. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that as read. Thank yep. you. There are at least four... Further examples of Wilde repeating the same point that the historic heritage of a building or place is as it is found, or in common parlance, as it looks today, not how it looked on the day it was built, or could be made to look again if renovated. As an aside, Wilde's report was accepted and Knott's own submission to retain the pools was rejected and the pools have now been demolished. It is of note that there is no mention in either Mr Miller's peer review or Schedule 8D that they actually meant that they think the houses had central front doors and symmetric windows in the past rather than now. If the heritage value is used to all have a central front door with symmetrical windows, but almost all have now since been modified, that is what should have been stated. Other HHAs state what is there now, not what was possibly there in the past. For example, Acacia lists building elements supposedly present in the street, but this is not the case for Oxford East. 
I believe it is more likely that actually Mr Miller and Mr Knott looked at the wrong houses, possibly the now proposed deleted Oxford Street West HHA, as those houses have the gable parallel to the street, which was another feature incorrectly described for Oxford Street East, and have some similarity to Frankton East houses claimed to be Ellis and Barnard prefabricated houses. Mr Miller did note in his report that he initially thought it was Oxford West he was peer reviewing. In Mr Knott's oral presentation at the end of 29 May, he also stated that there are three types of Alison Barnard houses, the ready to erect, i.e. prefabricated, the plan book houses, which would have been built by independent builders, not builders employed by Alison Barnard, and houses that have elements such as doors and windows made by Alison Barnard. Unless I missed it, he did not identify which of the last two types he thought we were now. Both Mr Miller and Schedule 8D specifically refer to the houses in both Oxford Street East and Frankton East as Alice and Bernard prefabricated houses. If they meant something else, they should have been specified and provided references to support this. There is no mention in the Fletcher archives of Alice and Bernard making anything other than the prefabricated wooden houses shown in the 1933 catalogue, farm buildings and components for houses such as doors and windows. It is of note that Alice and Barnard appear to have had a very strong relationship with the Waikato Times, with many very detailed media items found on papers passed in the 1920s and 1930s, including many showing wooden prefabricated buildings, but with no mention of another Alice and Bernard housing type. While the 1933 catalogue included some house plans, no reference was ever made to them by either Alice and Barnard or the media. When Alice and Bernard produced their 1945 house plan catalogue, it was clearly described as the first edition. Oddly, Mr Knott stated on Monday that the Alice and Bernard ready to erect or prefabricated houses were made from fribolite. Alice and Bernard were primarily a sawmilling company. The 1933 catalogue states that our ready-to-erect buildings are constructed of thoroughly seasoned building timber and the weatherboards are ordinarily, ordinary building quality dry tressed timber. There is no mention of fibrolite in the list of materials used by that company in that catalogue. Fibrolite cladding was first used in the 1940s due to shortage of traditional building materials such as timber, but the prefabricated houses were made from the late 20s onwards. Mr Miller's report stated that he had looked at just one title for Oxford Street and it showed that all the titles had transferred from the developer, Patterson & Patterson, to private owners in the 1920s. This is a complete fabrication. There are only three houses on Oxford Street title that were transferred in the 1920s, being 23, 29 and 33. Mr Miller either did not look at the title or he couldn't read the title. This error, like all the others, was copied to Schedule 8D. This, the, there is a clear copy of this title in Appendix H and it's up on the screen at the moment. Might be clear to you, it's not at all clear to me. But uh, yes, no, right. it's, it's yeah. difficult to... Um, <laughs> well, we can look at that later, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. I, I do not hear any comment from Mr Knott on Monday regarding the fabricated reading of the Oxford Street land title. I am very pleased to know how two heritage experts with international experience cannot correctly read and accurately document a land title. And as a side to that, in the um, built heritage report done by WSP, mm -hmm. I think is the name. Um, they also make comment about the Schedule 8 buildings in Oxford Street at the West End, and they also confirm that there were only three houses in Oxford Street transferred in the 1920s. To reiterate, Mr Miller documented that he and Mr Knott visited Oand Marshall Street together in February 2023 and saw central front doors and symmetrical windows on all the houses. He did not say that he saw that the houses used to have them. Three of the Oxford Street houses do not have a door on the front of the house at all. 
One Oxford Street house has French doors on the right side of the front of the house as part of modifications to the front and left side elevation fully consented in 2002. Only two of the seven Oxford Street houses clearly match the description of possibly a third house which is not visible from the street, possibly having these features. <coughs> Just to check, do you, those A, B and C refer to Oxford Street East? Or then hold the whole of Oxford Street? Just Oxford Street East. Okay. Yep. Yeah. None of the Marshall Street houses match this description, although some do have central front doors. In fact, three have a central front door and asymmetric windows. And by asymmetric windows, I mean different numbers of windows on either side of the door. Symmetric windows are the same number of windows on either side of the door. Mr Miller also noted that the gables in all houses were parallel to the road. So the houses all look like a basic kid's drawing. If the main gables were parallel to the road as described by Mr Miller, this would mean the houses have turned 90 degrees since Mr Knott visited, observed and correctly described this aspect in 2022. Mr Miller's report also noted that none of the sections has been subdivided, despite 35A Oxford Street being a very prominent two-storey A-frame building on a back section between 35 Oxford and 36 Marshall, two houses in the HHA. For them to have missed this house suggests Mr Knox and Mr Miller were not in Oxford Street or Marshall Street. Mr Miller did at least acknowledge that he had no proof of anything when he stated, during the course of the research undertaken into the Marshall and Oxford Street HHA, no further information was located that confirmed a connection with the railway housing or Alice and Bernand. There were no property records available that related to the construction of these dwellings. All property records and building permits post-date 1949. Monday's explanation by Mr Knott is the third iteration of our housing typology and heritage values as it appears we are now the used to have central front doors with symmetric windows and looks like the completely undocumented Allison Bernand non-prefabricated housing typology. We await the fourth iteration. Both Mr Miller's report and Schedule 8D change between all, meaning all 12 houses and all referring to just the seven Oxford Street houses. I am not sure if they are being intentionally vague or just can't make up their mind. Age of houses. The supposed age of the houses being early 1920s dwellings is included as a heritage value. When our theme was pre-1930, we did research on this and identified that it is likely that just four of the current houses were built in the 1920s. The other Oxford Street and Marshall Street houses were likely built sometime in the next two decades, with the most recent probably being 31 Oxford Street which is the only one built after the street had been connected to town water, so probably the late 1940s. Now, the reason that I mention that is because if you walk down the street and look at where the Toby is for the connection to the, to the houses from the council main, um, all the houses on the right-hand side, if you're going up um, Oxford Street, uh, built after 1949, and the Toby is more or less in the centre of the house. So they've laid the, the water main to the house prior to building the house. 31 Oxford Street has the same feature. All the rest of them, you can clearly see that the Toby is set off to one side. These houses are so low to the ground that a plumber cannot get underneath them to connect the water. So you can't lay your water main under the house. This is all included in our written submissions. It is possible there were other buildings on the properties before the current houses. Unfortunately, the council database is inaccurate for houses which were built before some streets joined the borough in 1949, with a default house age of 1920s, even where there is evidence that the houses were built later. And again, I just reiterate, you had um, the lady from who came and presented because Jacob Robb's wife was in hospital having her child, um, who said that the age of the property they own, number five, Oxford Street, uh, is incorrect. It's not built in the 1920s, it's built in the 1940s. So it appears that just four of the 12 houses 
uh, early 1920 buildings, and just two or three of the 12 houses match, match the basic description of what Mr Miller and Knott claim to have seen for all 12 houses when they came to visit in February 2023. House type. Let's look at what the experts think our other heritage values are. The housing on Oxford Street has strong similarities with the prefabricated Alison Barnard and railway cottages. Whilst it cannot be verified, it is likely that they are Alice and Berlin. My neighbour spoke about the three distinctive features of Alice and Bernand prefabricated houses on Monday, and I have documented them in both my 9th of May submission, that's the rebuttal submission that I made, and in the supporting document for this submission. From his comments on Monday, it appears that Mr Knott has now acknowledged that we are not the Alice and Barnard prefabricated houses shown in the catalogue and media. The two housing typologies which the Oxford Street houses are supposedly similar to are very different. The only similarity between railway houses and Alice and Bernand prefabricated houses are central front doors and symmetric windows, which, as already noted, are only visible on two Oxford Street houses. And now it appears that Mr Knott has created the third typology being non-prefabricated houses, which look like the Y Street houses in Frankton East. The Y Street houses have some similarity to the Oxford West houses, but none whatsoever to the houses in Oxford East. Apart from the two clearly visible Oxford Street houses with central front doors and symmetrical windows, the other houses have minimal similarity other than being weatherboard houses with iron roofs. The five Marshall Street houses are all very different from each other, with 36 Marshall Street being a two-storied house. All of the houses are small with minimal stylistic features. They are not particularly distinctive, unique or rare. Railway cottages. Railway housing has a very distinct typology. These 12 houses do not look like railway housing. This has been covered in depth in our previous written submissions and I will not bore you with these details again. Historic heritage value of strong similarities. In his March 2023 report, Mr Miller confirmed that there is no connection to railway houses nor proof of a link to Ellis and Bernand housing. However, then his report, which is copied to Schedule 8D, notes that he thinks the houses have strong similarities to railway cottages and Ellis and Bernand houses. Mr Miller appears to be saying that he thinks the Pattersons copied the Oxford Street houses from the popular railway or Alice and Bernand housing and this is a heritage value. Mr Miller does not explain how the builder copied features of a housing type that was not around until the late 1920s into houses that he also claims were built in the early 1920s. Significantly, none of the reports from experts has offered an explanation as to why houses perceived as displaying similarities, strong or otherwise, to another housing style can be considered to have historic heritage value. This is akin to someone painting a copy of the Mona Lisa and expecting this copy, no matter how good, to be valued as highly as the original painting. Gu notes in his peer review that, and I won't read it because it's yep. been yep. mentioned yep. several times by other submitters, yep. Quite correctly, Gu does not mention heritage being recognised because it looks like something else, even if it was a strong similarity. If the houses in Oxford Street East have strong similarities to the railway houses in Frankton Railway Village, they would have the majority of the unique features seen in these houses, i.e. multi-pane multi sash windows, not casement. Very decorative and ornate multi-posted porches, same size weatherboards and a central front door. If they have strong similarities to Alice and Bernand prefabricated houses, they would have the flat weatherboard profile, regular vertical battens and a very small, less than 60 square metre footprint. And if for a moment you believe there is a housing typology called Alice and Bernand non-prefabricated housing and the Frankton East houses are these, then the common features of those houses are highly decorative windows and roof ventilators. They are similar to Californian bungalows and all are very solid looking with heavy porches. The houses in Oxford East have none of these features. Historical connection between Marshall and Oxford Street. 
No reason is given for the supposed heritage value of the five Marshall Street houses. Note that the streets were developed separately for the, from Oxford. As noted in other submissions, there is no logical connection between the five houses on Marshall Street and the seven houses on Oxford Street. This is the only HHA that has a small number of houses on two streets that do not connect. And again, Mr mm -hmm. Wilde notes this in his June 2022 peer review when he points out this HHA is an oddity in having two different streets. And I've quoted it there, but yep. you okay. don't need to read it. Until writing PC9 submissions, none of my Oxford Street neighbours were aware of what the Marshall Street houses looked like other than the one directly behind them. Visibility. Most of the Oxford Street and some of the Marshall Street houses are partially or fully obscured and so cannot be seen clearly from footpath or road. This con contrasts noticeably with other HHAs such as Hayes Paddock and Frankton Railway Village. The lack of visibility may also be part of the explanation of how Mr Knott initially erroneously identified these 12 houses as New Zealand railway housing. Note that he said they were railway cottages, not that they looked similar to railway cottages. And then Mr Miller and Mr Knox have now erroneously identified the houses as all having a central front door with symmetrical windows and a strong similarity to Alice and Bernand prefabricated houses. Evidence and research. Unequivocal and documented evidence of historic heritage values must be provided by the council before an HHA and its associated restrictions are placed on properties. Many homeowners were very surprised and upset to be included in proposed HHAs as this is effectively a post-purchase conveyant on their property and restricts their future plans. As such, it is imperative that any HHAs are imposed based on evidence, not guesswork, not supposition, not speculation, not personal unproven subjective opinions, and not because submitters want to be in an HHA to avoid intensification. The Council and their consultants have not provided any evidence of heritage values for the Oxford Street East and Marshall Street Railway Cottages HHA. In fact, although both Mr Miller and Mr Knox claimed to have visited our HHA in February 2023, neither accurately described the houses. When Oxford Street East was initially and incorrectly identified as Railway Workers Suburb, I assumed it was a one-off, though very significant error in the PC9 process. It took just 20 minutes and around $100 to perform a simple search of all the titles that showed all of the houses had been privately owned at all times. Common sense also indicates New Zealand Railways did not build staff housing over a kilometre away from any railway infrastructure. However, Mr Knott failed to identify this and Oxford Street was put into a HHA with the theme Railway Workers Suburb. I'm not sure how 12 houses can constitute a suburb, but that's a different argument. And described as railway cottages. Mr Miller's review acknowledged that this was incorrect. However, in March 2023, Mr Miller's peer review report labelled us as Alice and Bernand prefabricated houses but gave no evidence as to what Alice and Bernand prefabricated houses looked like and what research he had done on Alice and Bernand prefabricated housing. And now it appears we're a third typology. It is of note that there is no mention of Alice and Bernard making any houses other than the prefabricated houses in the catalogue in any of the expert evidence reports used to support PC9. Alice and Bernand, neither the company nor any housing, is not mentioned at all in Miss Hill's special character report, the Morris and Counter report, or Mr Calloway's report on housing types. The only reference to Alice and Bernand and housing is in Miss Williams' 351 page thematic history where she states that the prefabricated houses were permitted in the Hamilton Borough in 1938. Not sure how houses that are built before then can be prefabricated houses. Consequently, to rebut the experts' comments, my wife and I have done extensive research on the history of Oxford Street, Railways Housing, Ellis and Bernand Prefabricated Housing, the Patterson family, and the Ellis and Bernand Company. We have documented all our research with images and sources of information, so everything we have said can be verified. Removal of Oxford Street East and Marshall Street Railway Cottages, HHA. 
Through personal connections, I had a historic heritage expert in Perth review our submissions, and they commented that they could not believe that Hamilton experts had got it so wrong. It appears that after mistakenly thinking there was railway housing in the middle of Fairfield, Council and its experts have tried to invent new reasons, again with a complete lack of research, to make these houses an HHA. I have documented the many failures and errors caused by the Council making erroneous assumptions and failing to complete due diligence in what has a very significant impact on homeowners. I will leave you to reread them as otherwise we will be here all day. If, as Mr Knott stated, the houses were something significant, but have been extensively modified, with all but two of the central front doors and symmetric windows removed, how can they possibly be the best examples? Our HHA consists of 12 houses built at different times in two unconnected streets over a 30-year period with no documented history. It is of note that all of the many submissions made regarding this HHA have been very clear that they oppose the imposition of the HHA. The lack of any definitive evidence has made it very frustrating when people cannot do simple things like fence their home securely so their child cannot get out onto the road or install a garage to prevent their cars getting broken into without incurring additional costs through having heritage assessments. If you have not yet completed a site visit, and you, I hear you're going to, so I won't read that out, um, I hope You've read all the evidence in our submissions and removed this fictitious HHA from Plan Change 9. And um, I'm quite happy to answer questions if you've got any at the moment, otherwise um, okay. I can do it after <coughs> my wife. No, let's roll through and yep. then we'll question you. Yeah. Denny Coty, our commissioners. I'll try not to ramble. The Council and Mr Knott and Mr Miller have indicated they have 100% confidence that Schedule 8D is correct. The fact that four HHAs were removed has been cited as an example of the strong quality assurance process and the accuracy of the HHAs. What they've not mentioned is that two of the HHAs now deleted were highlighted in Mr Wilde's peer review, prior to public notification, which Mr Knott and the Council chose to ignore. Mr Wilde recommended Jamison be deleted and that further research be performed for Anglesey. The Council also have not mentioned that the demolition of two properties had already occurred in Murrima Street. So unlike Oxford Street West, the fourth deleted HHA, it was not just a matter of being approved, there were two vacant adjacent sites. So prior to public notification, three of the four HHAs, which have now been removed as part of a supposedly robust process, already had red flags, which were ignored by the Council and their experts. I do not share this confidence in the Council's experts at all. How did an expert mistakenly identify two lots of houses in Hamilton, being Y Street and ours, as firstly railway housing, and then secondly as Alison Burnham who fabricated houses, and then say he meant the other Alison Burnham housing? How can his expertise in New Zealand housing typologies have any credibility? We actually became the Railways Cottage HHA because Mr Knott referenced the typology of Railways Cottages to a 2020 report by Ms Hill, which the Council had commissioned earlier. The report that Mr Knott referenced to did not contain the description of this typology. In fact, there was a glaring error that the description of transitional villas was recorded next to the picture of the Frankton Railway Cottage. It took four months and the intervention of the Mayor's Office to get the report updated to include the description of a railway cottage being houses made in Frankton by railways for railways. But due to this error, we became the Railway Cottage HHA. The Council legal submissions referenced Mr Miller's detailed research in addition to the very questionable research on the Oxford Street historical titles, Mr Will Miller references the Morrison Court report in regard to the following statement about the Sierra Crescent HHA. Mr Miller states that the area was developed after the end of World War II during a period where houses were being built to accommodate homecoming servicemen and their families. The Morrison Court report, which Mr Miller references the statement about Sierra Crescent, covers four selected areas of Hamilton. None of these include Sierra Crescent. The only reference to accommodation for servicemen in the Morrison Contra report is on page 35 in regard to Dens Street and Churchill Ave, which are on the other side of the river contain larger, very large two-storey houses, which have absolutely no resemblance to the housing in Sear Crescent, which has a very common style of state houses found in Fairfield. <coughs> yeah. um, and I noted that in the slides that you had. Oh, they're up there now. Right. Yep. They're okay. all done now, the slides. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mr Knott has ranked the four distinct Dean Street houses of three out of seven, and so they're not HHAs. 
not suggesting they need to be. But like the eight Oxford Street lands hub, this is an example of fabricated research. Do I actually need to point out I should not need to check that references are cited by historical heritage experts? I'm not referring to typos, like Mr Miller having the digit wrong for land chart. I'm talking about complete fabrications. For an HHA to be an HHA, it needs to have proven heritage values. It needs unequivocal and documented evidence. The evidence needs to show heritage value, not just state background, such as who to subdivide the area. It needs to contain facts, not subjective opinions or guesses. And obviously, it needs to be accurate, and any research reference needs to relate to the properties in question. After Mr Miller's peer review stated the Oxford Street houses in our HHA were likely Alice and Bernard prefabricated houses but gave us no information, my husband and I decided that we'd better research it. Um, we did different things but found the same thing without much effort. David went through papers past, found items about the houses, including one that said the Times had um, printed the first catalogue in 1928. He contacted the Waikato Times and they sent him a link for the later 1933 catalogue. I, taking things a bit more simply, just typed Alice and Bernard into the search box in Hamilton Library app, which popped up the catalogue as the third item, fourth item on the list. We visited the Frankton East HHA several times, trying to find similarity between the supposed Alice and Bernard prefabricated houses there, and descriptions of images in the Alice and Bernard catalogue and the Oxford Street houses. There is none. Just a bit there. A question, yeah, sorry, no. Waikato Times article at the end of 1930 states, sorry, back here. Just give me a moment. Just relax. Aside from the three distinctive features my husband's already described about Alice and Bernard houses, there's a fourth issue, meaning it was not possible there were any Alice and Bernard prefabricated houses in Franklin East. A Waikato Times article at the end of 1930 states that the Hamilton borough would not permit them to be erected in the borough. Page 114 of Ms Williams' 2021 report on the thematic history of Hamilton confirms that no, we're not permitted to be erected until much later. Ms Williams' report is included in the list of reference materials used by, I think, all of the experts. There's no need to read the entire 351-page report, and I haven't, but a simple search for Alice brings up the fact that the borough did not initially permit them, etc., etc. I question why neither Mr Knott nor Mr Miller checked what an Alice and Bird found Bernard prefabricated house is, despite updating the Franklin East HHA from local significance to regional significance when they included the White Street houses and added supposedly seen in Oxford Street. We're not planners or lawyers, but I do not believe historic heritage values are something which you should need a lawyer or planner to interpret for you. So in the absence of a peer review we could rely on, David and I decided to perform a common sense review of Schedule 8D for the residential HAs that were not previously special character or commercial zones. We looked at the documentation and visited the HHAs. Most of this is contained in our main line submission, and I'm definitely not going to read it all at all. From this work, I do not believe the Council of Experts has provided sufficient, or in some cases any, evidence of heritage values for all of the new residential HHAs. In the Adam Wilde peer review, the Council glossed over this, but of 32 HHAs, Mr Wilde recommended either further research or deletion for 17 of them. He noted that he only did a desktop peer review, but even without performing any research, he still had issues with over half of the HHAs. Red flag, anyone? The two review peer reviews performed in 2023 identified a large number of the same points previously raised by Mr Wilde and ignored by the Council. Some were finally actioned in full, such as Jamison and Anglesey, and some in part, but others have still been ignored. Mr Wilde recommended more research be for Casey, Chamberlain, Oxford East, Rero and Zier HHAs. Apart from adding background about the subdivisions of the others, the only research that's done is the addition of new and correct values for Oxford East and Zier and the addition of nonsensical test for Rero. Mr Wilde recommended the removal of, among others, all of the 10 1960s and 70s HHA, which he believed did not warrant inclusion in the district plan. Dr Gu also raised concerns about these. I won't read that. The 10 HHAs which contain 1960s or 1970s houses include around 350 brick houses and 15 streets. The described heritage values are all very generic. When the council revised all the descriptions, they've added details of subdivision and the street shape, but none of these are heritage values that meet the criteria stated by Dr Gu or the Waikato Regional Policy Statement. For example, in Seaford Street, the HHA talks about Mr Seaford and his house on the corner of Seaford and Garnet, but the HHA actually excludes the property despite it being adjacent to the HHA. So there's no direct connection with it. In the latest 
version of Schedule 8D, the summary values per Lamont, etc., states that the grid street network is not typical of the development period. However, in Mr. Knott's June 2022 report, he described the exact same grid of streets as being typical of the period. This is a clear example of how subjective Mr. Knott's views are. He's contradicted his own earlier view. The Catanac HHA contains one street of 13 houses, making it, I think, the second smallest HHA, which is just being described, which is described as part of a subdivision of over 200 acres. There is no explanation as to why the small group of houses is more important than the rest of the 200 acre section subdivision. The descriptions of most of the 60s and 70s HHAs include the supposedly distinctive features of either linked roads or cul-de-sacs. What this means is there are roads that go somewhere and roads that go nowhere. I'm not aware of a third alternative to this, so it is another meaningless value. Some of the earlier HHAs, which were under the other thing, pre-1930 early settlement, have 1930s houses, but there's no HHAs with privately owned 40s or 50s houses. Did Hamilton really go for two decades after the 1930s with nothing happening apart from state housing? The 351-page thematic review by Ms Williams has 76 references to the 40s and 50s, including references to the population and building boom. And then we suddenly have 350 1960s and 70s brick houses and random streets which need to be protected. I do not believe the council and its experts have provided adequate evidence of heritage values for any of the 60s and 70s HHAs. In his 2023, 2023 addendum, Mr Knott stated in relation to his 2022 work, time constraints meant that it was not the opportunity for research to be carried out for individual HHAs. I won't have a rant, but I, you can imagine reading that the person who has actually tied up my plans to my house hasn't bothered to do any research upset me slightly. In February 2023, Mr. 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 Knott and Mr. Miller visited HHAs. They visited them together. We can see this has caused a problem, as they both saw either seven or 12 houses with a central front door as symmetrical windows in my HHA. If it had been a true peer review, one of them would have seen the right houses and disagreed with the other's description, and one of them might have thought to do some research before declaring us Alice and Bernard prefabricated houses, or most likely. The updated Schedule 8D contains a lot more information and pages than the 2022 publicly notified version, but it does not appear to have any more evidence of heritage values. All the details of who did subdivision has now been researched and recorded. That's nice background, but I don't believe the fact that a retired builder and his builder son subdivided Oxford Street in 1921 is evidence of a heritage value. There are a lot of descriptions of the street shapes, which Mr Knott seems to think are heritage features rather than limitations due to geography and neighbouring streets and parks. Mr Knott clearly finds curving streets interesting, which is completely subjective. My husband finds rugby league interesting. I don't. Subjective opinions should not be included in the district plan. I think he's more objective than you, then. <laughs> Ob objective or objective? Right. The HHA descriptions include a lot of different ways to say a new street or area was developed because of growth. Hamilton, from its earliest days, has continued to grow and expand. This is well documented with the 12 expansions. Growth is not a heritage value in itself, or if it is, the entire city has the value. The Hayes Paddock HHA is a large area with around 200 similar houses. On this occasion, I agree with Mr Miller and Mr Knott when they say that Hayes Paddock is a significant example of relatively intact and architecturally coherent area of state housing. But now, Council wants to preserve a number of other streets with state houses which have nothing like the integrity of Hayes Paddock. The se selection seems somewhat random. Why Chamberlain but not Snell, which has similar houses? Why Sear Crescent but not Pollen Road or any street in Poets Corner? And what is the value of protecting a small group of state or ex-state houses? Many of the state housing HHAs are quite run down, with properties with motor vehicles on the front lawn rather than trees or garden, unmade lawns and other things which are common in low-cost rentals. Are these really the heritage values we want our city to reflect and be proud of? Heritage values should never be described using qualifiers such as likely, reportedly, appears. For example, it is likely that the Oxford Streets uh, Alice and Bernard fabricated houses seems to mean heritage experts didn't do any research to confirm or deny this. It's stated that it's likely that Sierra Crescent had the same history as described for these houses seems to mean that Mr Knott identified that Mr Miller's Morrison Conter reference was an error and didn't write to Sierra Crescent, but didn't have information, so he just added a qualifier. Either the council and its experts are certain of something, or if not, it should not be listed as a heritage value reported as an element relevant to decision to make an HHA. There are also quite a few unclear descriptions. 
The Rero Street HHA makes no sense whatsoever, and I gave up trying to translate it. I have put an effort into in the uh, rebuttal. In the Oxford Street HHA, sometimes all means all 12 houses, or sometimes it means the seven houses in Oxford Street, or possibly the five houses in Marshall Street. In both of these examples, it would be very difficult for any required heritage impact assessments to be formed, to perform, performed due to the lack of clarity. Even putting aside the lack of typos, which really, sorry, the many typos, which really make my head hurt, there are quite a few examples of unsubstantiated subjective views, and at worst, what appears to be a creative writing exercise gone wrong. Many of these have been documented in my eight, 9 May submission. This is a legally binding, legal and binding document, and yet Victoria Street is described in Schedule 8D as, at ground level, the narrow shop fronts provide rhythm in the frontages and contribute to the creation of a human scale. They provide interest to pedestrians by bringing opportunity for diversity and ownership of users. If there's an application for a consent for an alteration in the front of the building, how will the heritage historic so impact assessment identify whether the alteration will impact on the rhythm or human scale? Given that Schedule 8D is part of a draft district plan, it should read like one. The Council have provide, should have provided clear evidence of heritage values prior to public notification. This evidence should have been documented and verifiable. The fact that I'm saying this in my submission is an indication of a seriously flawed process. The Council's second attempt in 2023 to find heritage values has also failed to provide anything other than information about the subdivisions, more errors and less clarities. I do not expect to have to provide proof that I don't have a central front door, that my house was never owned by railways, that my house was not built in the early 1920s, and it's not a little Alice and Bernard prefabricated house. In addition to removing, removing the Oxford Street East and Marshall Street Railway Colleges, I request that you remove all the other HHAs where the council has not provided evidence of heritage values. Specifically, let me read those all out. We're just going to take those read. <laughs> uh, uh, your conclusion, um, if you want to read them out, that would be my guess. Okay, yep, okay, look, I'll cover the list. Um, basically, all the state housing areas are other than Hayes Paddock, so it's Casey Chamberlain, Fairfield Road, Sea Crescent, and the removal of Mariri Avenue from the Frankton East HHA. The removal of the incorrectly named Mariri, it's meant to be Matai, Hinao and Rata HHA, and the incomprehensible Rero Street HHA. I request the removal of all the 1960s and 70s HHAs. I also request that the council and its experts either research and accurately document the Frankton East HHA values or remove it. Dummy. Thank you, and uh, um, take a breath. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you both. Can I ask um, just a personal question? What's your background? I'm a hydrogeologist. Mm -hmm. Master's degree in geology from Auckland University and a postgraduate diploma in hydrogeology from the University of New South Wales. Mm. Mm. Yes. I'm an accountant and a writer. Right, yes, yes. <clears throat> I mean, you've obviously done an extraordinary amount of, of background work on this, and I'm not saying for one moment who we believe in that one, that's a matter for later on, but <clears throat> it is a prodigious amount of work, so thank you for doing that. Questions? No, just, just to add my thanks. I found it um, useful, all the information that you had provided to us. Thank you. But no questions. From you. I, I just found the detail very helpful in the work that you've done. Thank you. Um, I mean, putting aside the enormous amount of detail, which obviously we'll need to go back through, um, do, do you think that your area, and I'm just looking at the... <coughs> definition of historic heritage in the RMA, do you think that your area, as I say, put aside the detail, do you think your area has um, any um, values that contribute to an understanding and appreciation of New Zealand's history and cultures deriving from archaeological, architectural, cultural, historic, scientific or technological values? In other words, like, do you look at your area and say, yes, it has got some I bought my house because it had a large section and it's fenced well for dogs. Um, my next door neighbours built, all of us, I think, have basically got our houses because they're cheap. We're a cheap, very questionable area, um, which comes with, unfortunately, high time. But there is nothing, I mean, some of the houses, when they're advertised, they're advertised, I think the word funky was on the house when I bought it. Um, cute, things like that. Hmm. There's never been any indication that there's any history to it. and. They're just houses. It's known as a house, like prior to the HHA, it was a street that if a house went up for sale, it was gone in a week. Mm. It was a perfect first homeowner, and then they move out when they have family. Mm. They're too small to actually live in. 
Yes. So, oh, sorry, would you add to that? Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say that the houses are too small to yeah. live in with a family. Okay. But that's all it's known. I mean, the street, Oxford Street itself is mainly famous for the fish and chip shop. Um, and everyone knows that it's near Veggie King. Mm. I know you're not from Hamilton, but it's a very famous place. Yeah, so this is very practical considerations like most people have when you're buying a house. You never went into the area and looked at the wider area and thought, actually, this is pretty cool. These are all similar, irrespective of the, the detail. These are all similar, and we quite like living in a place that has um, the similarity. The, there is a vast difference between the Oxford Street HHA, the 12 houses, and, say, the housing in Cordlands or Hamilton East, hmm. or even Frankton East, which is... Uh, You, you mean the Marari, Pa, Tanifa, well, that block, that, that area? That, that area, yeah. yeah. Um, you can see the similarity of the housing, housing there, mm. and it's very distinctive. Um, the houses in, in Oxford Street East and Marshall Street are not similar at all. Mm. Um, they certainly don't contribute anything in terms of technological advance, because they're just basic weatherboard housing. Um, Largely, as everyone says, freezing cold because they're built without any real insulation and they're built low to the ground. Um, the answer is no. Yeah, yeah. Not, in not in any way whatsoever. Slightly different question, but the same theme. Um, I mean, <clears throat> we're having a, a, obviously a debate over these weeks with respect to character versus heritage, would you suggest that Oxford Street falls into a character definition or not even into a character no, no, definition? It's just literally, it's just a grotty street um, with a critical mix of houses. <laughs> You're um, not going into real estate, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the actual street itself in its entirety is a complete range of houses. Like there were some houses which appear on the earlier um, 1943, 1948 area which have gone. Um, so some houses we know have been removed from there and are now brick houses. So the house that's next to um, the Smiths you saw last week, some of, um, the house next to them is a big brick house. Um, and so we're sort of, we're just really a random, in the most random collection of houses. So, so this was a real surprise. Um, and there's very little you could actually say about it apart from the fact that it's a cheap street to buy houses. And it's close to the CBD. Um, yeah. When Jean was... Um, working for Genesis and yeah. in the city she would actually walk from home to, to and from. It's because it was faster than trying to drive. Yeah. 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 Alright, well, <coughs> thank you very much for your evidence and, uh, and the background stuff and, I mean, you know, um, <coughs> the other uh, reference documents that you've clipped in today, I look forward to reading some of those. I mean, it's, uh, it's good background stuff, so thank you for that. Uh, next up is the Waikato Heritage Group, uh, Laura Calloway and John Adam. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Laura Calloway and I'm a heritage consultant and uh, sometimes the person responsible for the Frankton Railway Village. Right. <laughs> now you're, you're, <laughs> Although I hesitate now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, now you're going to pop up several times today, are you, I for am. different things? Right, yeah, okay. That's correct. And right. I have with me uh, John P. Adam, uh, who did uh, call in last week. And, yes, uh, yes, we, <coughs> we met you virtually last week. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, the connection's better today. Okay, yes. <laughs> Yes, right. due to intercity. <laughs> right. uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, leave it to a few points uh, in terms of uh, matters and what I was just going to look at is point 14, which is urban landscape matters. And uh, the concern still remains that, while Mr Knox says that there's a level of detail provided within the proposed statements, um, 
that level of detail needs to be improved, in my view, and also to have that greater understanding of uh, the components and the significance and the layers of history that sit within the proposed HAs. For instance, in terms of uh, assessment of historic landscape, uh, one would have expected that was part of, of what you would do when you would look at a historic heritage area. Uh, you look at uh, the, the tangible things and the intangible, but you look at the layers. So you look at the, the cultures that have been in the place or still are in the place, you look at the landform, uh, you look at what's been modified, and that can inform what goes into potentially your historic heritage area. You know, for example, Hayes Paddock is on the side of a hill floating down to the river, um, and that form was actually uh, incorporated into the design uh, and would have been strong in terms of landscape architecture and the person involved in actually doing that. Along with other things like you know, not putting fences in the front yard, uh, which was one of the ways to get people to socially uh, interact across the street. So um, that, that understanding, I think, uh, still needs to be incorporated into the understanding of any uh, historic heritage area as it goes forward. And those old existing ones have some of that understanding in them. Also, that would also help with a guide, uh, a guide for owners because I agree with Dr McEwen, who was speaking yesterday, that um, it, it's, it's difficult for owners, uh, one, to comprehend uh, what might be possible and what might be important, but equally for a planner uh, to, to look and understand what goes into the ingredients and what the level of significance might be for those ingredients it is, is difficult and also um, for consultants too, if that detail's not there. And an owner's uh, guidebook, for instance, there's one for the Frankton Village that was done, I think, way back in the 1990s. Uh, it's a really useful tool. Uh, it, it breaks down that barrier between having a, a district plan, planner's document that's very hard to read, sorry, I'm not a planner, um, and having something that's a, a picture book uh, that can clearly explain what's actually important. And uh, that was something I was looking for um, because it's a tool that's been used for a very long time. And Hamilton, I think, also had the same for Hayes Paddock, my understanding. Um, the uh, uh, paragraph 17, uh, Mr. Knott was uh, uh, also saying that it would be a good idea to look at uh, identifying agricultural, industrial, scientific development sites and I think this is, this is a part of that discussion where uh, you can look at themes in different ways, like periods of time, you know, uh, development growth. Um, but you've also got uh, a city that's sitting in the middle of a region, and it has a regional presence. And uh, I noted uh, yesterday and the day before there was some discussion about the Waikato uh, Heritage Forum. Uh, and also about the role of the Waikato Regional Council. Uh, and way back in the 1990s, uh, there was a discussion about a regional infantry. As a result of that, around about 1997, 98, a number of the councils did actually get together and they did uh, what was meant to be a regional heritage study, which was done by uh, Diana Holman. And that has been filtered through the district plans, and, and you see a lot of that sitting there in, there today. But what it didn't take into account is that next layer up, which would give you comparison, uh, but also highlight whether you're looking at regional heritage. I mean, the railway village is done and dusted. You know, that, that was uh, 35, 35 years ago now. Um, but, but there's other um, potential heritage sitting across the Waikato uh, and how do you decide where it sits in, in terms of a level and, and that needs research and time and resources to go with it uh, but primarily back then uh, the idea was to actually have that wider view that then would allow that to happen because you know you can't go running around the country looking like I did at all the railway settlements for a decade or more. Uh, you know, that, that resource tool isn't sitting there 
at that level to, to give confidence, in my view. Um, the uh, 19, the concerns with the accuracy of the history of uh, Hamilton underpinning the HHAs. Uh, Mr. Not talks about uh, the changes that were implemented and in the introduction of the periods. And uh, I, I think one of the, the, the issues here is, is that the background documents are important that they're actually correct and uh, a, a review, a, a small, simple review, may be very useful um, to actually just pull out a few of those things that kind of need throwing out um, or fixing or amending or just slightly ad adjusting. So the purpose wasn't to say, start again, that, that's not good, um, but this is a document, the, the, the historical documents are going to last for a long time and, and they're uh, a much wider tool and, and it's important that they have a degree of accuracy in them and, and perhaps from the learnings, uh, actually improved as well. Uh, small little tweaks, in, in my view, are actually possible. And then that would help, for instance, with people coming forward uh, or the council coming back to look at potential other historic heritage areas because you know, there's other things that, you know, where, where's the information without having to go out and spend a whole lot of money again? Where's the research? Is there anything there? that's going to actually support what's being proposed. So I see that as sort of a, a refinement. So, um, I have been listening the last few days as best I could <laughs> to what's been said. Um, and uh, I, I did note a, a, a few things. Um, and uh, I'm just sort of trying to work out which ones to actually talk about. But um, I, I think... Um, one of the one of the items that Mr. Knott was talking about was um, he was talking about that initial cut when places were actually selected by walking through the streets, and uh, it was a very enlightening exercise when I read that. <laughs> it did show that um, uh, Hamilton's been fairly devastated um, by um, you know, garages in the front if they're not historic. Uh, and by info and rapid change that's actually happening. And in my view, it indicated that we're looking at now at snippets. Uh, we're not looking at, you know, uh, something like 150 houses or, or thereabouts or, or whatever the areas are. They're not necessarily huge areas anymore. And so part of that understanding, I think, is important when you then look at Hamilton's limited heritage but it also means you have to be super careful about what's actually being selected. And uh, I did find it difficult, uh, uh, you know, sort of, I suppose we call it going cold turkey, walking down a street without the background information, which I did for several of them, and, and using the system. And it did seem to me that it was much more streetscape orientated. Uh, and without that background information, you can get very mixed messages of what you're actually looking at. And when you're looking at historic heritage, you're looking at historical significance and uh, social significance, architectural significance, and you're trying to figure out which, or all or some, which of these things are actually put together to, to make sure that you've got something that's actually historical heritage and it can be supported and survive into the future, be robust. and. Uh, I have um, had experience walking the streets of Auckland uh, for several months, getting quite sunburnt, uh, and uh, that was part of the pre-1933 survey, uh, where we sort of walked down and said, oh, that house, all oh, that house. Several of us did that so that we had different people viewing uh, or looking, uh, and we discovered, for instance, there were a whole bunch of 1860 cottages down the Great South Road, all hidden in behind other cottages and wooden houses. Um, but, but it needed further research, you know, it was a look, but what were you actually seeing, it needed much more than just a look, uh, in my view. Can I just clarify, so are you saying to us then that um, 
while the site visit's important, it should happen later, so that you should have informed yourself about the various things before you go and walk the streets. Or, or like, what what are you recommending in terms well, of the, I'm, the I'm, methodology? I'm, yes, I'm not sort of, I'm not I'm not I'm not certain on that because I've done both. Mm. Uh, the problem is once you've got the history, then you see things very differently. Mm. And that was my experience when I tested it out on a place I'd never been to before. You know, lots of places around Hamilton I've been to. Um, but, but to me, there, there's, there's other things that you need to work through to see if there is story about the place. And I'm not sure that you see that by walking around. You know, I think back to um, the, the 1970s and, and the 1980s, if someone walked down one of the streets in the Frankton Railway settlement, as it was then, what would, what would they see and what would they record? And they'd see lot size and lot layout, they'd see the consistency, but they'd also see these terribly run down things about to be pushed over, which is what was about to happen, and also in a place that was completely undesirable, completely undesirable. Nothing was cheaper, really, than uh, those houses. And what if it, it hit that mark? Well, it's got lots of consistency going on. Um, but then if you looked at representation, and you spoke to someone back then, everyone said, oh, there were railway houses everywhere. Uh, that wasn't really the case. Uh, there's a very set number, and that's dwindled to an even tinier number. But I'm not sure, you know, how... how I mean, it's subjective, isn't it? I mean, you know, there, there's a subjective part to the way that you actually approach that. So, so um, what happened, for instance, in Auckland that I'm familiar with uh, and, and, and a few other places is that there was a, a background report done that was quite extensive and you had some understanding um, when you went in to actually walk around as to what you might see there, but you also got surprised by what you might see there. And it's things that are hidden and not street facing. And in terms of historic heritage, to me, if you want it to survive, uh, the people need to know about it. They need to um, have been consulted. They need to have time to actually think about whether it matters to them, because at the end of the day, the place isn't going to survive if the community aren't in support. And so, for instance, in Frankton, 50% of the community, they've all lost their jobs, uh, they're all getting chucked out, the developers were moving in, uh, most of them just wanted you know, to make a dollar, they're in all sorts of social difficulties. But within a short period of time, the consultation, it changed a little bit, and then it became very clear that there was probably more than a thousand people and numerous families sitting in the community and still in the settlement that had a tie to the place and had a sense of identity. And then you could get the layers of the stories and then you got that significance coming through and a range of the different things. But I'm not sure you would have seen it if you'd just, you know, walked down their houses. They were run down. <coughs> Let me take you somewhere else. <coughs> um, I mean, one of the things that obviously is in the back of back of the minds of, of the developers of PC9 is is to try and stop the inevitable um, and to draw a line at this point in time. <clears throat> Numbers of your professionals coming forward are saying we don't have enough information yet to to do that, and that's that's understood. Um, <clears throat> two questions. One is, are any of the HHAs, in your view, ready to tick? And that includes those that are translated from character, special character yes, areas? Uh, yes, Su subject to ensuring, in my view, it sits against um, significance in terms of um, criteria, uh, the ones that I'm very familiar with, which is the historical, you know, the statement of significance. Uh, ones like uh, uh, the Frankton Railway Village is, is tested through time. It had extensive research on it. Uh, you know, there's two years of research before it even got to the point of even considering it, and then more since then. Hayes Paddock has been through an extensive process, having been first um, identified way back in that heritage, regional heritage study in 1997, um, and uh, that went forward. And part of the debate about that one is that, did it go through as historic heritage, or did it go through as character? 
and something happened, I think, legally, which I'm not privy to, uh, but it seems to have come through as character rather than historic heritage. My understanding from the railway um, village is that it went through as, I think, a heritage precinct originally, so a lot of the community still think it's a historic area. Um, they were a little bit surprised to discover that it wasn't. And it seems that round about 2014, from what I've researched, is that there was a change to try and pull all these things, all these overlays together and bundle them. And, and you look at the bundle known as chapter five, and this is just my interpretation, and you see all these sort of mismatched overlays and you think, well, uh, there's railways in there, Hayes is in there, uh, a natural area was in there, um, a brand new, I think Peacocks might have been in there as well, which is a brand new area. Uh, and you're sitting there thinking, oh, so, so this is a bit strange. And I think what was probably missed in translation is, is there were things that were already sitting in what was closer to historic heritage at that point in time. You, you, you dropped and ran on the, on the criteria of significance. Can you talk a little bit more about that? <clears throat> what, I, what I understood you to say then is that the other HHAs on our table need to be tested against some canon of significance. What is that? Yes, so, so uh, whether it's uh, you know, the Hamilton City Council operative set of criteria, uh, or the regional one, which is, is very similar, almost exactly the same, or as Dr McEwen actually said, use of the Heritage New Zealand um, assessment. And, and that, uh, that is uh, a, a brand new document uh, that's, in my view, been well researched. I have to confess that until last year I was a member of uh, uh, Heritage New Zealand, but I did not write it. Um, but, but it's comprehensive in trying to explain to people uh, what should you be looking at and what is the threshold and is it local or regional? And it gives you that level of guidance and it's nice and clear and I think it's understandable. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's like social significance, uh, historical significance. What does that actually mean in a, in a heritage uh, language? rather than a planning language. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so apart from those two, apart from Hayes and, um, and the, the railway village, you don't think any of the current HHAs uh, reach that threshold? No, I didn't say that. Right, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> mm. um, I, um, I, th I think there, there does need to be some uh, refinement in what I'd call brown truthing. Uh, to know what's really going on down on the ground. You know, that those railway houses, uh, you could test the plan against the house, for instance. Uh, the problem in Hamilton's historical research is there's very little, a, a, as uh, uh, the people from Oxford uh, Street have actually uh -huh. said in terms of theirs. So it does make it incredibly tricky but, um, in trying to find plans. But I mean, we're at the point now where we're, we're being asked to make decisions. So the time, for, the time for, for further ground truth is, is that yes. arguably not available. Yes. Which is why I leap to the conclusion that you must therefore conclude that none of those others can move forward at this point in time. I think they, they have to have a bundle of research. Uh, mm -hmm. Portland's has a bundle of research. Uh, the Hamilton East area and the Hamilton East Villas, these have all been done by um, consultants engaged by the council. Uh, they've progressed through uh, the old system yeah. and they've got information and uh, uh, there's a degree of confidence, uh, I think, as a result of that. Right. Okay, so you add Hamilton East into that, so that's, that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> we sort of thank distracted you. you, so thank you no, for that. No, that's right. Um, Mr. Adam, were you, did you want to uh, you, you tell us anything you. different? Um, <coughs> I'll just add <coughs> some and. Um, yep. Yes, and just, just underline some of those. <coughs> so my, my name is um, John Adam. And I hold a Bachelor in Arts and Anthropology. <coughs> you introduced yourself last week, so yeah, I yeah, won't yeah, again. Um, so, to, uh, summar uh, to, to, um, to focus on uh, my, my requirement here, that, so the history of Hamilton City and suburban, <coughs> so the history of the Hamilton City and suburban public landscapes is not supported by their 
background reports in Chapter 19 review, um, including uh, historic heritage areas, which leaves a significant omission in understanding the origins of the reserves and streets, in my view, and does not provide an appropriate level of identification and protection of planted and built heritage landscape. Um, within all the historic heritage areas, the heritage landscape isn't, has not been assessed or included in the rules. Um, and the historic heritage areas that should have been created include the Hamilton Gardens Nursery, the Rurikura Homestead Drive, which is, is a memorial of, of trees, um, mostly the Totra, and, and, and the proposed Hayes Paddock Historic Heritage Area. The significance of the built landscape and its design, both publicly and privately, has been identified as important in my view. But there should be a specific report on the built landscape of that proposed. A number of areas such as Hayes Paddock and the Franklin Railway Village have existing information. Now, for all historic heritage areas, there needs to be a heritage management policy guideline for the replacement and repair of infrastructure, including preferred trees, to assist owners. This is common practice uh, overseas. I think Ella will mention those, those guides. Um, so looking at heritage landscapes, urban placemaking has been occupied by a diverse range of relatively new experts, such as historical geographers, environmental historians, and garden historians, who study the written, pictorial, and and the field to interpret and explain both the creation and evolution of a historic cultural landscape. So you, you go backwards and forwards. Um, I've just completed a report on Point Heron Park in Auckland. So you look at the existing material, you go on the site, you check all the written material is accurate, and you find most of it is not accurate. So then you have to do further research. You keep going back to the field, looking at the physical evidence, what you see in the written material. And you just keep doing that. You might do it two or three times, and then it, and it sort of it finally it all it all comes together. <coughs> and that, and, and that, of course, that is not that is there'll be further research done in the time. So it's, that's as best you can do at that time, and, and it'll, it sets a benchmark. <coughs> I mean, a classical literative process. It, it, yes. Yeah. And it is important. The field, the field, as I mean, the field is going into the. And I, I'm not an archaeologist, so I, I have to look at the physical site without actually doing any interventions. I, I can look at you know, garden archaeology, you know, looking at the physical terrain. But um, So the continuous landscape design process tends to, to physically bury in situ the historic streetscapes and open space fabric, but it can and has been recovered throughout New Zealand by archaeological and other professional schools. Examples of the fabric would include wooden or stone cobbled pavers, terracotta dish drain systems, railway network tracks, pre-electric lighting infrastructure and the roading network. There has been some acknowledgement of the retention of some character elements via consent orders, but these elements are but few that have existed. So, submission uh, 427 by the Waikato Heritage Group requested Council conduct a citywide heritage landscape assessment review that identified historic areas be scheduled. And other councils do undertake heritage landscape assessments, such as Christchurch City um, and also um, Dunedin City, and I, I worked on those some 10 years ago uh, with a team of uh, historical planners, uh, architectural historians, archeologists, and, and historians. And in, the, in those documents, we had the joy of, um, and the the, the trauma for me, um, of, of John Wilson, who was a noted mm. historian, he, he did all the work. So you, you have a team, and, and that, that document is, is more, more policy directed. So the, just another submitter, 198, um, a group of architects named within their submission to seek um, the work of landscape architects whose work forms an integral part of the built environment be reviewed into Chapter 19. Um, Mr. Knott's development periods reflects a focus on the built heritage and has not been an integrated approach to historic heritage areas by omission of the built landscape heritage assessment. 
I consider that placing greater emphasis on surroundings and landscapes has the potential to complement and enhance the efficiency of the historic heritage area. Uh, Mr Knott has acknowledged that the historic landscape is missing, um, but the historic heritage area contains many trees, both native and exotic, and of course these are actually on, on understand, private land that is, that is considered out of scope, uh, according to Mr McNaught, you know, when it's assessed as under the STEM system um, and the focus of the STEM, as you've heard, um, the notable portion was, um, was lowly rated by um, consultants. So in conclusion, in my view, the current plan change as notified provides no supporting framework objectives, policies or rules for the management of historic landscapes. Only four buildings. A foundation for the formulation of plan provisions for achieving this is required in my view. Within all the historic heritage areas, the heritage landscape has not been assessed or included in the rural framework. Um, for example, um, the Hamilton Gardens Nursery, the Rurikura Homestead Drive. Um, in the proposed Hayes Paddock heritage, historic heritage area where a set number of trees uh, were provided for each section by the state, uh, and they are reported planted by the original tenants of the state houses um, is, is missing in, in the history. And that, that, that appears in the local newspapers, and um, I discovered that the other day. Um, so finally, for all historic heritage years, there needs to be uh, the, a management policy guideline for replacement and repair of heritage structure and features of the built landscape, including preferred trees to assist owners. Uh, this is, as I've mentioned, I think repeated earlier, uh, is, is a common practice overseas. And I'm thinking particularly of North America, um, that they're very good with any public landscape, whether it be public parks or cemeteries that provide um, you know, guides to all the artistic history, um, the material the fabric and, and the history. So I'll conclude that. Statement. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Uh, oh, thank you both. Any, you and any questions of either? Ms. Calloway. Um, in your evidence, sorry, but this is for Ms. Calloway. Okay. Um, in relation to, you've outlined um, some comments in relation to the provisions. So you've talked about demolition, adjacent sites, definitions, building heights, I think were the main um, things you picked up on. Um, and you mentioned contributing and non-contributing um, for demolition only. I think it might have been yesterday or the day before, we, um, we've had some evidence from, I think, Mr Knott and maybe Dr McEwen about um, the impacts of demolition and that having a vacant site is actually worse than having what's currently there. Just interested in your view on that in terms of the rules. Right. I think it depends on um, what, you, what within the historic heritage area is seen as uh, vacant. So, and, and what has been demolished. So I'm familiar with a number of the historic heritage areas around uh, the Wellington region and uh, where you've got uh, buildings that may be contributing and buildings that are potentially noted as non-contributing for the purpose of demolition. And uh, in my view, that uh, type of tool can, not always, um, provide uh, some guidance as to is this intrusive or is it not? And it gives you a comparison between something that may be significant and something that may be able to be lost in the process of uh, change and development that takes place. Um, however, the problem with uh, these particular ones that I'm thinking about, which is uh, Petoni, uh, Main Street, Jackson Street, and also Adelaide, which is very old uh, state housing, is that if you don't actually uh, review and keep up your historic heritage area um, cumulative uh, review of what's actually happening, you can end up with uh, something that you think is non-contributing, 
that in time or with more research becomes contributing. And of course, you know, vice versa, you might discover that it doesn't have any value and, and it can potentially be lost when someone else uses the site and develops something with some key things. So if there was to be adopted a, a rule around um, contributing and non-contributing for the purposes of demolition, would you see that as applying across the whole of the HHA so that any buildings um, within that site, even if they're, um, you know, say the house has got some historic value, but there's a garage that's, you know, more recently built than 20 years ago or something, it would apply to the, to the garage but not necessarily the house? I, 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 I do think because of what we're looking at, which is many large housing areas, that it could be very useful. Uh, to actually have that particularly for something like um, a garage and then potentially if it's known then it's not going through a, a costly resource consent process. Uh, it does mean the documentation just needs to be uh, quite clear uh, which can sometimes be tricky but I mean uh, you know most people realise what a skyline garage is. Uh, I think uh, non-contributing purposes for demolition for some items uh, would actually assist with reducing. So does that does that categorisation apply to a generic structure like Skyline Garage, or do you have to do a site by site assessment and before you bring down the non-contributing? It would element? be best practice to do a site assessment. That's what I had assumed, but I just yes. wanted to check. And, and I think that's part of um, you know sort of that that true thing of, of these particular oh. areas is that. The next layer down is to, to look at the street or the suburb and, and look at the, the house, the garage, or the shop, whatever it might be. And it should be possible to actually map some of these things, you know, because you know there's building consent sitting on file, uh, you know, for, for many of the things that have actually happened since 1975. Um, and that would be helpful. I mean your experience of that. Um, how difficult it is to draw the threshold between the two. Has it, has it typically been fairly obvious so that, so that that's not contentious? Mr. Mr. Um, Adam, by all means sit down if you want to, yes. Uh, uh, I mean, because one would assume that as soon as you introduce that sort of uh, a bifurcation, um, most people will clamour for it. Yes, of uh, course. It's risky. It's very risky. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where you need the finer detail um, at, at the level that both owners, planners and consultants can actually use. And I think mm. this, is, this is the same thing that uh, the, the other uh, heritage experts on it, <coughs> to me, has been talking about. It is, it's, that, it's that finer filtering uh, and, and whether contributing or non-contributing the purpose of demolition is the tool, uh, I, I think needs to be considered. It may not be the best tool and it does have risk with it. Mm. Um, and just another question, um, and it um, harks back to the question of the chair in relation to the um, HHAs, which you think um, have uh, enough research that we could carry them forward into our decision making. I was just interested. Obviously, we've got a number that were in the op that are in the operative district plan, um, which you didn't mention. Just wondering your view on the ones in the operative plan. Are they sufficiently tested that we could carry those other ones through? And I think you know the examples are like Victoria Street and Temple View. Um, I think there might be others, but yeah. I think there's a degree of confidence because they've been through a process previously and, and reasonably robust. Uh, Temple View went through uh, a major process there, so I believe so. Uh, Victoria Street, um, that's actually dates back to the um, late 1980s, uh, and I was part of the group that actually initiated and uh, proposed it. The community here put that forward, and so that's actually been, uh, that was documented way back in about 1980. And so most of the buildings, for instance, in Victoria Street actually have um, a building file with documentation that then either led them to be uh, scheduled with uh, Hamilton City Council or listed with Heritage New Zealand. And so going down that street, there, there's, a, uh, th there's a strong layer, but I think that has to be co coached against that information was done way back in the 1990s, 
but some things were missed. Uh, and, and there's new potential there. And so I think it's a matter of being careful, particularly with Victoria Street, before you say contributing and non-contributing as to what that is. But that there is uh, data in behind, historical uh, significance documents sitting in behind those buildings. And of course, with you know the example of Victoria Street, there's been um, an expansion of that area from the ODP to include um, parts of Hood Street. Um, did you have any view on on that? So uh, initially, uh, when, when the South End was put forward, which was to uh, sort of rescue the buildings which were about to be demolished, many of them at that time. Uh, the, the idea of a historic heritage area was actually different to what's been put forward in Victoria, which is street, which is mainly a building focused one. Back then, the idea was to have layers of culture because it's a point of intersection uh, with Tainui, militia, and, and the layers of colonialism that sat on the top. So the link was down to the river, uh, which is very important in the history of this area. Uh, it included landscape uh, and it included sites. And uh, there were more buildings in, in Knox Street than there currently are now, many of them being lost. Uh, there are still archaeological sites there, of course. Uh, uh, Hood Street has had some significant change at the, uh, the far end up against Anglesey Street, which you want to be familiar with when they look. But again, uh, there's also that, that layer of buildings in Hood Street, they were actually part of that original um, community proposed historic area way back in the 1990s. So uh, in my view, there's a, a degree of confidence because there's research that's been based on, on heritage significance. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, earlier in your, um, Ms. Callow, I think you, um, earlier in your presentation, you, um, talked about just reading um, through Mr Knott's um, street surveys and what have you, and being a little bit dispirited about the level of um, disappearance, if I could say that, of um, historic heritage. Um, and I think you mentioned that we're now getting to sort of like small areas that we might need to identify, because if you go bigger than that, it gets diluted. My word, not yours. Um, but. Have you, have you got any advice on sort of what the characteristics, the minimum characteristics, if you like? No, I don't see those as being sort of slam dunk criteria, but sort of strong guides as to what you're looking for in terms of the size of an HHA, whether it's bounded by streets, whether it spans both sides of the street or not. I think it has to be strong enough and robust enough to stand up and last in terms of its valuing and, and, and those, those, those boundaries become very critical because you want to hold them as long as possible. I'm not sure that there's a magic number like uh, 5 or 10 or 15. I think it's understanding why that is important. Um, a, a, a group, I, I think uh, Dr McEwen actually said the other day, is it's possible, you know, for instance, and uh, if I use the example of Marama, uh, the, the seven sisters there are, are famous, uh, but they're a particular small group, and yes, I think two or three of them at least, if not more, are probably going to be removed. And um, so you get things nibbled, nibbled, um, so then uh, potentially maybe they can be done under individual items, and maybe you manage, if there's that many left, and who knows, uh, that you've got four in a row, and uh, Mr. Maunders' uh, little uh, houses are um, a group that individually looked at. I think it's very tricky. I mean, the, the problem with the district plan is it talks about heritage items and notable trees and SNAs, and you sit there and you think, well, historic heritage, cultural heritage, it's across this, and of course, it's all the missing components like. Uh, to whenua, but the history layers that haven't been addressed. And so I think it's very hard to, to ring round, this is the number you need. It, it's really what's the significance of the place 
how intact are they, uh, how authentic. So usually in heritage you're looking at authenticity and you're looking at integrity and then you're trying to align it to the storytelling. Mm. Just made me think of another point there, which is like the sort of the sustainability of, of heritage over time. And I'll perhaps contrast that with, say, the, the existence of a, a character villa that, that is now in an industrial area or an area on the sort of the edge of the CBD, for example. We had one yesterday morning. Um, but, but that sort of example, we, its surroundings no longer give it context at all. I mean, uh, does something like that, how is something like that going to survive? It, 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 with great difficulty, uh, it, it, it might survive. But for instance, if you look at Wellington City, which has been city for many more years than Hamilton, you've still got little things sitting in the city up against the high rises. Hmm. And so while their, their complete context is gone, you turn around the corner and you see this little, most of them are colonial, but not all of them, uh, you see this, this cottage there. And, and by having this massive development around it, it sometimes actually focuses you on the little thing and you go, oh my goodness, you know, th this is, must be a gem, why is it here? So I think it's a, a site by Mm. kind uh, that needs to be looked at. I don't think it's a matter of saying, well, it's the last one in the street and everywhere around it is, you know, twelve-story apartments. It's really what is the significance of that place, and does it hold enough significance? <coughs> Condition is a whole different story. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. I think we've had a good go, and uh, you've got several other appearances. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, thank you very much for coming and we'll now take a break until uh, 11 o'clock. Thank you very much.
Just, uh, thank you very much. Um, the next tranche of submitters represent the Frankton East Residence Group. So we have it's Williams and you are sir, you David Sorensen, are you? And and you are Brenda or are you Margaret? I'm, I'm Margaret. You're Margaret. Okay. Uh, you're Margaret Sale. Yes. Okay, so Lynn Williams is not joining us. Pardon. I had no. I'm Lynn Williams. You're Lynn Williams. Brenda is not here. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> all right. Well, now I know who you all are. Yeah. Right. And and uh, um, I mean, Miss <clears throat> Williams, you and Miss Calloway are popping up for the yeah. rest most of the Very day. So yes. um, we might get you. And uh, well, <clears throat> I think you're in the next. You're the next group, and the group after. Right. All right. What do you want? Who's who's leading off with? Right. Thank you very much. Ah, good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Sale, and I represent the Frankton East Residence Group. There are also two other speakers presenting: David Dark Sorensen, speaking on the history of Frankton commercial heritage, and Lynn Williams, on uh, an expert witness. I also have a PowerPoint that shows our main points and a small snapshot of some of our houses in the Frankton East area. <coughs> As a community group, we do not have the resources for lawyers and the planners, but our concerns are real and we seek them to be addressed. We live in, I have lived in Frankton for 40 odd years and brought up a family, and I like many others, hope to spend our retirement years living in our existing homes. Our Frankton East community is an example of old single story houses and an established community with a strong identity. Many residents are long standing and now there is a new generation raising up families in our quiet, peaceful neighbourhood. We have residents who have enriched <coughs> the area in which we live by planting out the gully and their sections with native trees. So we now enjoy more bird life than ever before. It has taken decades to see the impact of these changes. In a short space of time, we completed a petition for the historic heritage. 48 people agreed that they would support a proposed historic area in principle. We thank you, the Commission Panel and Hamilton City Council for considering to extend the historic heritage area boundary for Frankton East. However, there is history hidden in these buildings which we would like to capture more that fall outside the new proposed historic heritage area. For example, who built them? Many were no, well-known businessmen, for example, Alice and Bernard. Frankton East offers a small but important enclave at the city fringe, connecting us to the past, present and future in the face of the rapidly changing face of Hamilton. Summary of what we'd like the Hamilton City Council to implement into the future district plan. One, the protection of significant historic heritage in Frankton, such as residential and commercial areas. Two, we would also like to see other notable buildings and constructions in this area, area included as well. For example, historic garages, workshops and concrete fences, etc. And the whole street included, not just part of. Three, interim protection from development by providing a buffer between the single storey heritage houses and the new developments that are planned for the future of Frankton and the wider Hamilton. And that these new dwellings be visibly similar in scale and a gradual height from the historic heritage houses in that area. We do not want high rise buildings next to single story heritage houses. Four, we are concerned at the damage that can be wrecked in a moment, sub suburbs around us, through indiscrimination development whilst the area under proposed extension is under consideration. Five, stronger rules set in standards, policies, and even a resource consent to apply to all dwellings so that things are not improvised or makeshift. Six, historical heritage, 
history, overlay is needed in the Hamilton City Council District Plan to modify the degree of change in Hamilton. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Sale. Mr. Sorensen, are you next? Yes. Thank you. I've just got to check that um, this will work. My wife and I have lived in um, Tanifa Street for over 30 years. Um, as part of it, we requested a submission that all of Tanifa Street be included in the proposed HHA. At the moment, these few houses at the end of Tanifa Street are not included in the proposed one. <coughs> um, while it has been extended, um, the properties at 10, I mean, sorry, 18, 20, 22 and 24 represent the next stage of early development in the late 1940s, early 1950s. The property is also bought as a gully, which marks the edge of Jolly Farm. And Jolly's were the ones that, it was their farm that um, most of Frankton was built on. At least one of these houses has a tie to, um, these are the kind of houses up that right of way, at the end of the street. Um, one of them, I better say, at the moment, um, it looks like a little bit of a demolition site. It isn't really. The neighbours um, had to re-roof and then found that it needed to be structural work done on it as well for the new roof. So at the very end of the driveway, I don't have a picture of it, is a house that you wonder what's happening there, but it's going to look pretty much like it did before. Um, anyway, the properties there, uh, one of these has a historic tie to Frankton Village that it was built for Ernie Ellis, who was a butcher there from the 1930s onwards. He purchased the land at 22 Tanny Street in 1947, and the building, the house was completed by 1950. So with the war finishing in 45, this is early post-war. Um, and that's remained largely unchanged, apart from minor renovations and painting. The inclusion of these houses, plus um, there's been two additional houses built up the same right of way that are small single storey houses that are in behind things so that you don't really see them there but they are at least on the same sort of size and scale as the rest there. These, adding these to the proposed historic heritage area would provide an accurate picture and record of the continued expansion of Tanifar Street during the early post-war years, help to retain the integrity and authenticity of the H A, sorry, HHA as they are visually similar scale character and height to the proposed HHA. They connect that area to the gully and would reduce the impact of further development if, say, the HHA went as far as proposed and then you had these buildings gone and massive other buildings right at the end of the street. Just to confirm, um, does 24 <coughs> Tanifa Street have a dwelling on it or is it just part of, I'm just looking at the, no. the district plan map, is yeah, it just part I of the... I can show you on... The gully. That's the very <coughs> end of Tanifa Street. Um, I'm just figuring out how to do this here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, that house there is 18. Mm -hmm. If I see right. No, it's not. Sorry. That one there is 14. There's a small house built at the back of that. 18 is there. Next one along is 20. 20A is a small house built behind it. 22 is there. And 24. Yeah, okay. that's 24. 26 is actually down into the gully. Um, it's, um, I understand, like it, it, it's built so that there's a, you can drive underneath it, and it's because the council needs access to the sewer main at the back, because there's a sewer main going right through that gully 
the pipes are there and everything. Um, so amongst all the trees and everything like that, that's what is there. One of the houses, um, uh, let me see if I can do this right. Number 14 there, there was um, a guy that built that house, used to live at number 10, he grew up there. Um, when he married, he bought number 14, which was there. At the back of his house was a um, cottage. <coughs> Him and his wife lived there until he built the house at, um, in the front of that. <coughs> the cottage now is number 24 Avon Street because that part was um, subdivided off. Sorry, I pointed out the wrong one there, I think. Yeah. yeah. Terrible eyesight. Um, that there is 14. That there is the cottage at the back. Um, that one there is 16. So yeah. I'm talking about 14 is where he lived and grew up. I mean, didn't live there. He lived at 10, but bought that property and grew up there. We felt it's important to preserve the history and character and natural environment of all of this area, including Tanifa Street and this kind of development. Um, that's the view just at the end of Tanifa Street when you get to the bottom. Sorry, gone back again. Um, just before you go up the right of way driveway. Um, I'm going to get on to the historic bit in a minute of, of the Frankton commercial area. But before I do, are there any questions or any? Um, just a, a question to clarify from um, Ms. Sale, actually. Um, you said you wanted the whole of the street. Were you referring to Tanifa Street as a whole? That was the street you were wanting as a whole? Mm. Yes. But also, were you we, saying that the whole area? We would have liked the whole area, yes. Y Street, um, Torrington Avenue, and Avon Street. I, I realise Avon Street is questionable. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Chair, on, on yeah. that point? Yeah. Have, what consultation, if any, have you had with those other streets in the broader area uh, to see the level of uh, acceptance? Have, have you done a letter drop? We've done a couple of letter drops and we've organised a couple of meetings. Uh, our last meeting was in the Scout Hall in Norton Road. We had quite a big, quite a big turnout for us, about 20 people. So when you think about the number of houses that would be affected versus the number of um, people participating and giving you an opinion, could you give me a ratio? There's probably quite a few more than that. Like, um, I took one petition round um, only on Tanifa Street. I didn't go to anywhere else. Every place I went to, whether they were owned by the person or somebody renting there, they, they, I said, why do you like to live here? What is it? And they said, it's the feel of the place, it's the community, it's the look of everything. You know, it, it's that kind of thing. Sure. Um, and as part of your... Um petition, did it explain the consequences of becoming an HHA and the, uh, the potential ramifications? And I'd be particularly interested in your answer. Um, if they were rented, in your view, should have that information gone to the landowner? as they are the ones that would have to carry the burden of any rules. I'm, I'm just trying to get a feel yeah. for, uh, you know, what exactly. efforts... Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Fair whether enough. or not yeah. those who would be affected yeah. have had yeah. an opportunity to express an opinion yeah. and are aware of the consequences. Just, can I backtrack a tiny bit? I don't want to take up too much time either, but um, first, for us, we're one of the ones in the right-of-way, I mean, in the that driveway up the top. I knew nothing about the HHA. Um, we got a letter to do with the SNA at the back of the property. 
or, or two thirds of our property as part of the SNA. So I'm here again Friday. Right. Um, but so we got a letter about that. We also got a leaflet in the mail that said about um, intensification and other things. But it was only in talking to one of the neighbours who was on the other half of Tanifar Street, because initially one half of Tanifar Street was in the HHA and the other half was in inten intensification, some sort of, you know. Um, as part of all this, around that time, 31st of August, my mum passed away in Christchurch. Sorry. My two brothers lived there and I was organising the funeral down there from here um, and every, um, the executor of a will and all those kind of things. So there's a, this all happened. We also had two computers at home that both decided to die at the same time. And we were, on the 15th of August, we were putting in, no, I flew down to Christchurch and back. Then we were trying to put in things for the SNA and then we discovered what HHA was and intensification, plan change 12, all the other things. So it kind of all... <laughs> so just on that point... Yeah. Um, I'm sorry for the... Yeah, loss yeah, of your net, yeah, um, yeah. My question is, did you receive a letter addressed to you as the owner regarding um, the HHA? No. Could that have been that you missed it? No. Because you were away? No. Right. No. You got we... one for the SNA, yes. but not one for the HHA? Yes. Yes. And have you asked your other members who attended some of the meetings whether they had received a letter concerning the HHAs? The two houses either side of us are rented, mm -hmm. and we contacted the owners there, and they had no idea of anything of this. Um, okay. Either, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> but obviously at some point you did oh, yeah. receive that sort of information because you, your submission was made in time, as I yes. understand it. What happened was we rang um, somebody in planning at the City Council to ask about if, with the SNA, what effect would that have, say, if we wanted to put a small cottage at the back of our house and all this kind of thing, and they said, oh, you could put a six-storey building. And I said, what? And that was the first I knew about intensification and in Plan Change 12. So, yeah, that, that's the way it unfolded for me. <clears throat> but did that also trigger your awareness of the HHA at that stage? Yes, state? yeah, because by then we'd talked to a few neighbours round about and right. found things and, yeah, so that, that was the direction it headed. Yeah. Um, All right, back to your uh, submission. Um, going back to whether we spoke to the owners or just the tenants, on our... Um, uh, petition. petition. I've just worked it out. There was 22 owners and 20, 20 renters. Thank you. Is that what you wanted? Perfect. Oh, thank you. Sorry, you should have gone for the short answer, eh, Margaret? Okay. Um, the area that we also talked about in the um, in our group submission was the um, Frankton has um, commercial area um, it has just well you've probably heard the history before I don't know but just to quickly go through um, Thomas and Mary Jolly purchased some land for a farm in 1867. The area of that farm is on, that's a more present day map, if I can, bounded by the uh, Hamilton Lake up um, Killarney Road more or less. It follows the stream all the way around there um, to the, um, joins up to Seddon Road, comes back round. The area that we are talking about is this area in here, as far as the residential area. 
and then the commercial area is mm, yeah, in, in this area here, near the railway line. Okay. In 1877, um, Thomas Jolly offered railways access over his land. A railway station was built, the first train arrived, and the first subdivisions of land were sold that same year. Not only was he a farmer, he was an entrepreneur. Um, in 1910, over 80 trains were arriving in Hamilton each day. When you think about daily commutes to Auckland, <coughs> there were quite a few to choose from. Apparently, day and night they were running. In 1913, um, Thomas's son, Frank Jolly, became mayor. Frankton also became a borough. And that house was built in 1910 for Frank and his wife up on the hill overlooking the lake. There was various heritage places that we had in Frankton. A library that was there from 1923. A movie theatre, a town hall. Um, they've gone. The library went at the same time the overbridge to, um, or the Massey Street overbridge was built, the town hall round about the same time. The movie theatre did in 1967. I'll come back to that a little bit later. In 1948, there was a terrible tornado. It's actually probably the worst one there's been in New Zealand. Three people died, one died in her house, um, two others died of injuries afterwards. There were 150 homes damaged, 50 businesses damaged, and repairs cost round about £1 million, which is roughly $60 million today, equivalent. So that was 1948. So that was where a lot of buildings changed in the business district. There were also, it was a pretty sad time, but I must tell you, I know you've listened through a bit today so far, the bank across the road from Hughes and Jenkins and had its, all its shop windows blown out, and there was a recently deposited cheque from the draper's shop at that bank that appeared several days later at the Cambridge golf course. There was another weird thing happened, <coughs> car painting business in Kettle Street had the entire roof lifted and dropped a few metres away. It landed over a vehicle and protected it from further damage. The business owner had gone outside to investigate the roaring noise. He was swept off balance, flung his arms round a power pole and he flipped round it several times before coming to rest. He went to his, back to his workshop looking for his coat wasn't too concerned about the coat, but he was concerned about the 300 pounds that was in the pocket. He put out an advertisement in the Waikato Times lost and found column and received a phone call from a farmer out at Eureka. He said he'd found a coat in one of his paddocks. When he described the coat to the farmer, the farmer said, and your money's in the pocket. The 300 pounds was still there. So there were sad things, but interesting things happening around that time. I know it's a bit hard to see, but that's the, uh, the red line there is the area that's proposed as a HHA for the, the business area, or that part of the business area. The pictures around the side are some of the buildings there. Sanford Clark's General Store. It started out as a wooden building in the early 1900s. Sorry, getting too enthusiastic here. Um, later on in 1911, it was, it, he built a two-storey building there. And in 1923, there was a further addition and that building is still there now. The in 1929, this hotel was built. It was the third hotel on that site. Um, the first one burnt down, it was wooden. The second one, also wooden, 
it was shifted back on the site to make way for this building and this was built in an L shape and the old hotel was still in behind it. 1913, the post office, that was its third shift. It started at the railway station and then gone to the um, Spence building and then a new um, building built in 1913. There's still, part of it's still there <laughs> if you look at the shape. 1937, the Coronation Building was built. Um, Forlongs, that was their very first store. They shifted in there in 1946. And Belgrade Drapery. Now that building was a much newer one. And at my first look at it, I thought, I. so what? Belgrave's Drapery and Clothing Store was established on that corner in 1908 by Morris Belgrave. His son built the existing building in 1960. The family biz business continued till 1983, in which th at that point it was sold to Helen Steins. It's had a few other owners since then, but that's one of those where the site is significant, more so than the building that's there at the moment, although it's all related. 205 Commerce Street, 1920s. The left-hand side of the book, it, of the shop had a succession of butchers there, not the one that built the house in Tannifar Street. He had one, he was a butcher across the road from there. Um, Frankton had four butchers at that time in the 1930s. The right hand side shop was a chemist for 60 years, and then the chemist built the building next door, which is now known as the Kershaw Building or um, Spencer's Menswear. Sam Spence um, had a menswear shop. He worked there the whole time from 1920s to 1980s. The building existed in 1911 because that photo on the right was 1911, so I'm not sure who built it then. Sam was another, he was an interesting guy. He didn't believe in cash registers. He had cardboard boxes to put different notes and coins in, in his shop, and that's how he did things. Um, there's also a um, metal pillar from the original building, still on the, still there, what was there a couple of Sundays back. Um, another building is the Gosling building. Now that's slightly out of this area. What used to be between that and the hotel was the movie theatre, but it was taken down in 1967. So it's a lonely building by itself. There are others, this one is out, is still in Commerce Street, Main Street of Frankton, in, in the shopping area, I mean, Main Street of Shopping. Um, and there are individual buildings that are still, you know, quite important in the whole, um, in the whole area. These buildings are not included in any of this at the moment. But there's things like the building on the left was the police station, the one on the right was the sergeant's house. The um, other one is the dry cleaners. And these are just some of the other buildings that are in, from the later periods that still have a significant part of Hamilton history, but they are um, not included in, the, in that um, particular area. The other thing that confused me for a start, I don't know whether it did you, were the Hamilton, uh, sorry, Frankton East group, and I thought, how come? But it was only when I started looking at the history and Hamilton West was the other side of the tracks to what Hamilton East is, Hamilton West became Dinsdale. So that's the where Hamilton East is, is where the shopping area is in Frankton and the, um, the rest of... Frankton going towards the um, gully and the edge of Jolly's farm. I've got myself lost. It won't be a minute. My wife said, don't do that. There's also, these ones are um, buildings built way later than the business owners were there. 
Some family-run um, businesses have been trading the Leong since 1917, Proud Lock since 1932, Garvey's the 1930s, and Lala's who had fruit shop um, were there for about 80 years altogether. The significance of the buildings needs to be valued and their integrity shouldn't be compromised by inappropriate development. It doesn't mean there shouldn't be any development, but things should sit in character or in... Unfortunately, we don't get a full picture of the historical significance of Frankton due to each aspect being looked at separately and in isolation. We need an integrated approach which acknowledges the the natural, social and historic significance of this important suburb in Frankton's history. That is the end of my... <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Sorenson. you very much. Ms. Williams, your turn. Thank you. Is it OK if I stay sitting? <clears throat> no, that's fine. And okay. I assume you will take us to your summary statement? Excuse me? I assume you'll take us to your summary statement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So my name is Lynette Williams and I grew up in Hamilton, uh, went to school here, came back 26 years ago after a career in museums elsewhere. So I've been engaged by the Frankton East Residence Group um, to look at their evidence and to look at the effect um, of the historic heritage areas, um, the proposed heritage areas. Um, including the residential area and the commercial area that David's just described. And I endorse the comments made in their original submission regarding the criteria used for identifying historic heritage areas, that the criteria should be reviewed to better reflect historic values rather than, um, well, as Ms. Callaway referred to earlier, driving around the streets and looking, as you people are going to do this afternoon, um, looking from the, from the street. But really what's important is the stories and the history behind um, the definition of the historic heritage area as also supported by the RMA definition. I support the request by FERG, uh, Frankton East Residence Group, to have a more comprehensive evaluation of historic areas and that their setting, their context, and their structural elements, not just the houses, but um, items such as utility buildings that might be in the backyard, so not visible from the street. So it seemed to me that reading um, Mr. Knott's descriptions that a lot of what counted as heritage in his definition had to be visible from the street. And then I have to bite my tongue, so I'll say no more. Um, but items such as the fences, you know, such as if you go to the Frankton Railway Village, you get that those um, low fences with the wire netting, which I've always loved since my childhood. Um, my nana had one like that in Martin, possibly also a railway cottage. Um, and it's the fences, it's the structural elements around those properties. Uh, the workshop at the back of Ten Taniwha Street, for instance, was the builder's workshop. That's what makes up the story, that's what makes up the heritage. I seem to have diverted from my script. Um, so basically, um, I re-endorse Mr Knott's extension um, after hearing the um, submissions by the residence group um, to, to extend that um, Mariri, um, Pa, Taniwha area to include Y Street, Torrington Avenue, and more of Taniwha Street to get both sides of Taniwha Street. And I would like to um, also endorse um, David's submission about including up his driveway with his four um, buildings, houses up there, with a relative similar, similarity to each other, if not to the whole street. Um, it's just an extension how that street developed, and that's the story of that street. There are anomalies when you drive through there, as you will see this afternoon. There's state housing in Mariri, and it's not one great big long block of state housing. It's um, intermingled with private developments. So you don't get that consistency that Mr. Knott was um, seen to be promoting as 
the main value for one of the main values for a heritage um, area. Personally, I don't believe that heritage has to be consistent. And one other, I'll just do an aside here if that's allowed. So some of the areas within Hamilton, I see the farmhouse in that cul-de-sac, the farmhouse that remains. And to me, you look at that villa and you think, why is there a 1900-something villa in this area of 1970s housing? And to me, that's the story, is that villa was the farm. And you can see that on the, the Summon Beer Squad I'm thinking of. You can see Mr. Dinsdale's house in Dinsdale Road. Um, <coughs> it's there because when that subdivision happened, they retained those significant houses, or Dinsdale was you know, the naming of the road. It was his driveway, basically. Um, so that the, the story of that subdivision, or that particular street, hinges to me on that extent farmhouse and the subdivisions that subsequently occurred from, um, from, for that particular area. Okay. But I do think that there needs to be, as um, Laura Calloway mentioned earlier, further research and further refinement on the history and to better inform the heritage areas. And I hope that Council, or the Commissioners and the Council, will work on that um, so that you do have more information on which to base your decisions about the heritage areas. And I think in reading the other, several of the other submissions, that's been a, a major point, hasn't it? It's another bit of a paradox, Ms. Williams. You're, I mean, you're, you're supporting and advocating for, for two HHAs on the one hand, um, but then you're saying we don't have enough background story and history to support those. How do you reconcile those two positions? Having spent several weeks researching, are you referring to Fairview Downs? The private no, 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 I'm referring to the ones in front of us now, the extension, now. The, ex the extension one uh, through White and, uh, and the Franklin Commercial and the, the extension to include, I think, Gosling Building, I think, was the proposition. I've researched the Gosling Building. So the Gosling Building that David showed a photo of um, Mr. Knott decided not to include that in his hmm. commercial heritage area um, because it was disconnected. <coughs> to me, it is not disconnected because the site in between the Gosling building and the hotel has been vacant for decades since the uh, movie theatre came down. The Gosling if you're looking at the story of Frankton, the Gosling building is it. It was built for a real estate agent, Mr. Gosling, and he was the clerk, or secretary sometimes, the clerk to the Frankton Town Board and the subsequent local body, the Frankton Borough Council. And those that board and that council met in his rooms. And I have seen one advertisement um, relating to um, you know, the council meeting will be on such and such a date. It actually says in the Frankton Council Chambers, comma, 62 High Street, Gosling Building. Well, it wasn't 62 High Street, the Gosling Building in High Street. And Frankton did not have a purpose-built council chamber or town board chamber. But Mr. Gosling's rooms became that. And to me, that's part, if you're looking at historic themes, as I did for the thematic review of Hamilton's history. Um, and those themes were actually given to me by the council to read and you know, to research those themes. Rather than by development periods, I think I've lost the beginning of my sentence. If you look at the historic themes, and one of them is local governments, governance, then the Gosling area, Gosling building is a standout as part of the way Frankton developed both residentially and commercially. I haven't let you go into the commercial bit yet. Mm. So I, I mean, done that a lot might, of research on the yeah. residential that, that, area. That, 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 might, uh, that might argue for the Gosling Building being the centre of an HHA. I, I, I guess what I'm asking is, is, is are you satisfied that the, the HHA <clears throat> that's currently proposed, with or without the Gosling Building, the commercial? Mm. has sufficient 
coherence and significance historically that it makes sense. Yes. But that doesn't seem to square with your with your commentary that, that these things need more research and so on before before establishing the HHAs. I have not read that Mr. Knott has done a considerable in-depth history mm. on Conway Street. So why I've should we why, so why should we put in place an HHA if that hasn't been done? That's that's the number. I would of the like question. to see a direction from the commissioners to the council that such research needs to be done, not just for this resident, not for this, not just for this commercial mm. area, but for mm. other parts of the HHAs. <clears throat> but, it, but but that's before establishing the HHAs, or are you comfortable no, with while the HHAs? You're still, while you're still considering them. Mm. Okay. In order to consider them with more <clears throat> information, so you're asking results. you're asking for a period between between now and our decision for work to be done, then to be brought back to yes, us. I That's am. really what yes, you're asking. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there has been research done on Frankton commercial area. Um, Barry Leverty has got this fantastic book that he's you know done. It's basically a photo essay, but he's done a lot of personal information with regard to particular buildings. And I haven't found much fault, if any, with um, Barry's work in, in that document. Um, I've not seen that it was referenced. I've done my own research for the thematic history. And another um, aspect of my work is writing um, potted histories of particular individuals, the Dead Tell Tales in the Waikato Times every Saturday, <coughs> two and sixpence. Um, and I've done research on Gosling, which will be published this Saturday. Um, several members of the Jolly family, because they are they are Frankton, they're very significant Frankton. Fra Thomas Jolly created Frankton, full stop. Um, so and yeah, so I've done quite a bit of research. Not in a book form, but um, background research on the histories of Frankton. Okay. Should I continue with my? Yes, yes, please do. <clears throat> Partly do uh, contradict myself, as you might be suggesting I was doing, driving through. Tanifa, Pa, and Torrington, Hawaii. Yes, you can see that they are a group of similar period houses. Um, I haven't done the research into Alison Vernand that um, Mr. White and um, Mr. Rell have done, but they've referenced it well, which can be followed up by council staff or employee contractors to, you know, to, to verify their, their information. But just looking at those buildings, you can see that they are of a piece. You know, there's a few anomalies in there. There's the state houses, which um, between themselves are coherent. But the general architecture, if that's what you're going to take as a value, the criteria, <coughs> criterion, um, then the architecture of those buildings does cut the mustard, basically. Does rate. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I think we've mentioned Ms. Durrell and Mr. White. So the Franklin Commercial HHA to me, is not, does not fit the consistency standard. Um, they are definitely each um, separately, separate architecture. They don't, they're not distinctive um, architectural style, most of them. 1911 Gosling, the, the hotels, you know, 1920s, did you say? And, you know, some of them have been added to and modified, even the post office, but you can see the bones of the post office in that photo that David showed. You can see the, um, as it was, and you can still recognise the gable form at the front of the building there as it is now. So, to me, that 
that does fit into the development, I haven't even mentioned development, that does fit into the development period that um, Mr Knott has proposed as um, the theme, or the, the way that the um, HHAs have been selected. Um, but it, it's there because, it, to me, the, herit uh, the heritage value, the stories behind the development of Commerce Street are what count. So, so can I ask a question on yes. that? What, what comes yes. What comes first in, your, in the theory of or the best approach to the methodology? Should it be the, um, the historical themes, the storytelling, uh, and then move through to the, um, uh, the de development period? Or just help me understand what you feel the methodology process should be. I think themes first, stories first, and does it then, but part of that, um, one of the, the themes that I did for the thematic overview was development, you know, through time. So the economic development, let's be starting with 1877 for Frankton and going through the development of the street under the heading economic development, but it's also not economic, it's not just economic, it's supporting the residents. You know, they had their own shopping centre. Frankton people went there to do their shopping rather than Victoria Street because it was handier. Um, you know, push bike, whatever, they're walking. Um, so to me, the, the theme, the, the, the subject comes first. And but within that subject, the development period can be looked at. And one without the other? Possibly not, no. No, haven't thought that through. So you think it's best practice to have a combined hybrid to get a broader view? Yes, yes. Certainly looking at the development of suburbs. You know, we've got standout 1920s for the railway, 30s, 40s for Hayes. Um, the Tanifa area, 19, late 20s, 30s, and into the 50s, late 40s. Thank you. Yeah, so. Thank you. So, yes, I agree that the information provided by HCC on the proposed HHA is limited. But in my opinion, both sides of the block of Commerce Street between Kent and High Street um, do warrant consideration as an HHA because that's the, the original <coughs> block that um, Tom's Jolly put up for sale in 1877 and that's how it developed from there. Um, Mr Knott has provided two maps with the proposed High Street to Kent Street and he, on the second map he has put that little extension around to capture the Gosling um, building in High Street. Um, I'll just point out that he hasn't quite got the dots right on that map. He's got the hotel as proposed when it's actually not just scheduled by the council, it is on HNZ's list. And um, he's got the Gosling building, which is only proposed as um, on the schedule. Business of the view shafts, which I think is important. Frankton developed as a railway settled as a railway railway area. It was based on the railway. That's how the businesses sprung up from there. There were boarding houses. The Frankton Hotel was mostly well, not just most. It was for accommodation um, more so than for drinking. Um, there were a lot of built boarding houses and hotels in Frankton and of course the cafes and who were supplying that terrible rush when the train came in and left again. Um, all those sorts of businesses were part of, they functioned on the railway, based on the railway and we've lost that a lot with the railway station being shifted a bit further south than Commerce Street. But it's important that railway land is still there, the railway line is still there, to get that some sort of view shaft 
from Commerce Street. I understand that there are buildings consented that are going up within what is that current view shaft, but they'll go. And so I would like to see that um, some sort of forward thinking codicil that can be possible in the district plan so that um, in future the possibility of having those sight lines to the railway line um, are considered. And the other aspect that um, I think commissions need to review is the uh, Frankton um, neighbourhood plan, which was put forward a few years ago as a basis for consideration of the Frankton commercial area being a HHA, because that was came through the community feedback. Um, Response to Dr. McEwen on behalf of Cote Pacifica. Um, it's basically, I agree with her that um, it's more appropriate to use the um, heritage assessments that are currently the City Council, and also the Waikato Regional Policy Statement and Heritage New Zealand Assessment Criteria. That Cote Pacifica building where it sits has been occupied since at least 1925. And there's photos in um, Barry's book, Barry Lafferty's book here, to show that um, parapet is quite visible in streetscapes. So I um, maintain that that certainly does belong within the proposed historic heritage area. Um, I think it's probably. Do I need to read out my conclusions? <coughs> conclusions there. Not if you yeah. don't need to. No. Um, just on the uh, the uh, Kauai Pacifica uh, building, um, <coughs> they're seeking uh, the ability to do certain modifications uh, for cultural purposes as as a permitted activity. Do you have any comment on that? I haven't seen the design plans. So I don't know. Mm. Um, I would like to see that it was in keeping, so single or at the most two storey. Um, I don't want to get in the way of development, mm. and I absolutely love the Fale on Mill Street. And it reminds us that you know, a high proportion of Hamilton's population are Pacifica, yeah. um, which we tend to ignore. Um, <coughs> but you'd want a process of vetting of the, uh, of the plans, for example. Sorry? You'd want a process of vetting of the plans. Yes, not right, to make, <coughs> well, that, yeah. yes, that, that there would be in, um, in coherence and in keeping mm. with the heritage buildings around it. Yep. It's like the building on the, um, the 1960 building. You know, it looks very modern in contrast to the 1910s, 1920s, 30s buildings. But that building was designed by a Hamilton architect, um, D.H. Angus. And when he built it, it was part of, it was for Belgraves, which was so the, the history of that building is not just in the superstructure, it's, it's in the footprint and the, the family history of the traders behind that. So that it, you, people might be tempted to exclude it from the HHA because it looks modern, but it is part of the history of Conway Street, as would be the Celtic Pacifica. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just one question from me in terms of um, you've you've said that you know there has been a significant amount of research done, but there are still gaps and further needs further research needs to be done. Um, and we've had submissions from others saying you can always do more research, but at some point you have to kind of draw a line. Um, and obviously we're charged with drawing that line. Um, from what you've read and, and from all your um, research in the area, um, have we got enough information before us to accept any of these HHAs? Are there any that you would say to us, um, while you could do more research, I'm satisfied that these are clearly, um, we've got enough information that you could, you could um, adopt them? And if so, what are those ones of the HHAs that we've got before I us? Only, I can only speak to the ones whose history I'm familiar with. Mm. I, did the drive-through of most of the HHAs some weeks ago, and I sort of thought, really? Why? What's the story? And this one looks very much like that other one, and this one and that one. There were about five 
streets I've never been in before, mm. but I thought they look very similar. So are they the same builder? Do we know that? Are they the same developer? Do we know that? And I fail to see that even that history um, as to why it was they were chosen as um, heritage areas, other than they looked nicer on the street. Mm. And I don't think that that is a that's character. Mm. There's nothing wrong with character, but that's not what the heritage areas are allowed to do, according to the next plan change. So, um, in terms of the ones that you have looked at and researched, um, what are the ones, are, are there any in the list that is before us that you are comfortable um, meet those criteria? Where's the list? Um, well, certainly Frankton East Heritage um, Residence Area, um, Franklin Commercial. Um, I grew up in Casey's Ave, so, yep, Casey's Ave's a goodie. Um, Claudelands, I've done some research for the Claudelands um, shopping area and Giaha Street, certainly go for that one. With extensions, with extensions. Um, Claudelands, Claudelands is a standout, as, um, and obviously um, the railway village and Hayes Paddock, that goes without saying, I think. Um, there's a lot that aren't in there. And like Dr. McEwen said yesterday, why not Lake Crescent? Mm. You know, and that's got history to do with the hospital. A lot of those Lake Crescent standout houses were not only descendants of major landowners, but they were the, the medical superintendent at the hospital and other doctors at the hospital. So there's another theme that you might be looking at in terms of not just the period of development, mm. but how do some of those areas relate to our health system or health facilities? So there's another whole way of looking at these that Dr. Not looked at those originally, but then went to this development period overlay instead. Um, aspects of parts of Mairo and the um, heritage areas there. I've got the list in my head. <laughs> got the list with you? No. Um, um, yeah. Victoria Street was obviously... Oh, Victoria yeah. Street, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Extending into Hood Street. Um, to capture, with an extension, um, um, Mr. Dot has chosen the east, northeastern corner of Alexandra, but the northwestern corner is also a heritage building of the corner of Hood and mm -hmm. Alexandra. Um, there's been a lot of changes on that street. But there's certainly some very significant heritage items in North Street, and again, it tells the story mm. that development in town. I mean, Alexandra Street was a late intrusion, a late development. Um, so, the private submissions, Fairview Downs and Queen's Avenue, which I'm also supporting, I have done the research on those two areas, and although Mr. Knott has discounted both of those, and yes, I get to speak to them in five minutes' time and tomorrow, um, <coughs> but those are two areas. The depth of the research into those certainly, it's the level of research I would expect for all of the heritage areas, quite frankly. Thank you. I'm um, just. One question on a moment ago, I get the feeling you might have alluded to some of the newer areas um, newer. Mm -hmm. in the you know, 70s type mm -hmm. housing mm -hmm. and some of the, um, <clears throat> the outer suburbs. And is that because you didn't really identify the stories yes. that would go yeah. behind them? That they were, you might go up and down the street and say, yes, these are all typically um, two story lots of red brick, you know, sort of the, yeah. the solid sort of 1970s build, <coughs> but you couldn't, you didn't identify the story. Is that no. because you maybe yeah. just haven't looked at those yeah. areas? And um, 
and Ms. Callaway said that a lot of those might be built on, I can't remember the Christian name, Mr. Veldwijk, Veldwijk, who was a Dutch builder, lived in Cambridge, but then he um, came to Hamilton and he built and developed a lot of houses hmm. um, of areas. Um, so some of those, they may be Mr. Veldwijk's uh, that he built, and they, therefore there's that coherence in there as part of that story, right. but I've not seen that identified. Right. Um, just, I think you're saying that you wouldn't rule them out just because of their era. No. No, no. No, okay. no, no. No. But some of them look to be very similar to <coughs> others. Yes. So I don't know why they were chosen <coughs> as opposed to the others. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah, Mrs. Williams, I'm just interested in your opinion. Can you have a, um, you know, a building that would attract um, a heritage item status, you know, either A or B? Does that have to come with an HHA? As in, does that have to be part of a historical heritage area? I, I'm just trying to understand the argument between, you know, a particular building which has uh, a historical built heritage and the necessity of it being part of an HHA. Or, do you want to? Uh, okay, Thanks. I haven't explained. So are you saying does a heritage standalone building need to be part of an HHA? Yeah, I'm just. I think given that the changes that have happened throughout the city in terms of demolition and infill makes that impossible. Right. So, um, have I just wiped out the Gosling building? I'm not sure. But that's not my decision. But the Gosling building has been separately proposed as an individual building as well, with some rather strange history associated. But, um, and I think it equally that one equally sits, even though it's a bit disparate from the. It's continuous. It fits with the story of that HHA up the street around the corner. And it, it addresses the railway line. Right. So you've only got that building and you know, one facade of the hotel facing the railway line, the main trunk line, which was the reason they were built, which was the reason they were there. But the Gosling building could stand alone, yes. Um, and some of the buildings were ready, the Loaded Hog or whatever its current information mm -hmm. is. And right. Hood Street, you yep. know, it's been scheduled for a long time. And other buildings in Hood Street have been scheduled as themselves rather than part of an area. So of course it's, it's possible. My purpose of my question was the opposite. That sometimes I, th I wonder if while trying to pr protect some buildings we put a, quite a, a wide HHA over where, the, oh, okay. where there is some debatable uh, argument as to their pedigree and, and whether or not the better instrument is using a heritage item status, you know, a, 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 to schedule the building. I think that one um, point that um, Ms. Sale made earlier about not wanting to have a multi-storey building next door to the HHA, that there needs to be a buffer. Right. So that sort of thing could apply in the commercial areas as well. And I understand that Mr Knott wasn't asked to do the commercial areas when he was first mm. commissioned to do this job. And I think that's got a, a major bearing on the, the range of HHAs that he has proposed. Um, and you might want to look at that again, quite frankly. Um, and extend his contract to do some more of the commercial areas. Um, it is the case in some areas that the HHAs are anchored on an existing heritage building, you know, a, known, a known scheduled building. I wondered whether that was what your question was, whether you start with the heritage item and look at its overlay, and look at its surroundings, its context. Thank you. I mean that's obviously a different another way of actually establishing HHAs is to uh, is to contextualise mm. a scheduled building. That's, mm. a, that's, that's the way I would do option. it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's not the way it's been done, obviously. No. Yeah. Okay.
right. All right, thank you, Frank Dunn East. Um, thank you. Oh, can I stand up and then sit <laughs> um, uh, Peter Weir and Co. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think you stay where you are, don't you? Yes, I think. Uh, and we'll try and get you through by lunchtime at half past 12, if we can. I uh, know, I'm just saying we'll try and get the next group through by half past twelve. So um oh, we need a group So we keep it short. Uh, well that's one way of reading it and it's the right way. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we'll try to be very brief. Right, okay. We're interested in lunch as well. <laughs> yes, we, this is Queen's we're talking about, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's correct. Right, okay, thank you. So, so yes, you are going to see myself and William. Uh, Miss Williams has completed some preliminary research, uh, which I've utilised. Um, initially, when I went down Queen's Ave, to put a background, um, I did go down without that information uh, to have a look at the street. I'm, of course, very familiar with it. Um, driving of course is different to walking um, and uh, I found that an interesting exercise again uh, in, in trying to use the criteria. Um, you'll recognise that uh, as Mr Not pointed out I made a boo-boo um, and added one point <laughs> uh, which is an error on my part and of course reduces the score down to below the proposed threshold. What I however did after um, uh, I had uh, looked at the street without the historical background as I utilised uh, the documentation that Miss Williams had actually provided. Uh, that's historical information and also the subdivisional uh, titling. Also did checking on uh, some of the dates of the houses, uh, which as Mr White pointed out earlier, um, sometimes you can find and other times it's very difficult. Uh, but of this in particular street, uh, there are actually uh, some reports, and they sit in the Frankton Borough rather than Hamilton. So um, I, I um, reviewed my, my thoughts and my marking criteria, and um, in my view, it still has merit as being representative, but it's not as a whole street. You know, it's over a kilometre long, uh, and of course it's got little side pieces that come off it. Um, but it does have um, a story to tell, which is uh, the Jolly Estate. Um, it has the main uh, homestead at the very top of the hill. It's a very strange little street in some ways, with the bypass. Um, it's got a clear family subdivisional pattern uh, where, where Mrs Jolly, uh, her daughters and sons, uh, actually um, developed the land in a very short amount of time, uh, consequently the houses, a large number of them, maybe about 35 to 40, are all pretty much at the same period. Um, it's tricky uh, because a lot of this history hasn't been written up, a lot of the resources aren't quite available. Um, there was a comment that uh, from decades ago that it was known as the World War I soldier settlement. Uh, I can tell you it's incredibly hard to find some of this research Hence, you know, um, we've men I've mentioned it, uh, but that needs further research and outside of the scope of what was possible. So, in looking at um, one kilometre worth of street, uh, if you take away the fences, uh, which of course uh, populate that street because it's incredibly busy, it's the main route between Hamilton and Dinsdale, for many people, uh, you see a, a range of uh, cottages and it is a range, so, so there's uh, little cottages and there's more wealthy cottages sitting there. Um, and they are still there. And yes, on one side of the street, there's a great big gaping hole. Uh, and there's an incredible amount of infill that's taken place, uh, which of course is not dissimilar to other parts of the town these days. Uh, but I still think that it should be considered. Perhaps, uh, and Mr. Weir might not agree, um, character might be more appropriate, um, but as you're probably well aware, uh, that option is not available. And so finding the threshold between character and historic heritage is a little bit problematical, in my view. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank can, you. can I ask a question on just that point? Can you point to me anywhere else in the country where we have a situation where we've got HHAs and character? Yes. So, so Wellington City Council, who started looking at their character and historic heritage heri for changing their district plan, is a really good example. Um, I think this, I was involved uh, on the sideline of that. I wasn't one of the main parties, but I was able to review the story maps for it. Uh, approximately nine historic areas, which of course cover most of Wellington City, and that's why there's so much talk in, you know, in the town about character. But within those nine, not all of them, you will find um, a historic area in, in the little shops, uh, or in you know, the little Thorndon um, houses, uh, which have been there for, for decades. And so um, they uh, divided, I think, that they've looked at the character areas and reviewed them. They took a team of five consultants in. They mapped every single house, amazing job. Um, put it down on a map so you could see it in the way that um, you know, Dr. Gu was mapping uh, the city. And you could see the pattern. If you looked at each of these nine centres, you could see, with a number of them, historic heritage was right in the centre. You know, it might be two, three, or a small group, but, but, it, but it was self-evident. And uh, it's actually available up online. It's the 1930 Wellington City Council character uh, study. Uh, and the recommendations of both uh, particular consultants who are uh, the leading ones and well, some of the leading ones and heritage consultancy said, well, you need to protect the character areas. You probably need to expand the character areas. Um, that's not the decision that's currently on the table under the... But from your uh, professional system. opinions and expertise, HHAs and character can be quite, quite complementary yes, in terms of, of yes. a, as a mechanism for uh, protecting the broad interpretation of heritage. And yes, yes. I mean, it, it, the, the, the railway village and Cordlands happened about the same time, but Claudins happened first, and that was the reaction to the infill, and they wanted a character area, and they've actually held it together, so that's a really good example of character. But if you go back in and look at it today, you actually see, oh, it's actually survived, but now there's more stories known. So back then, the stories weren't known. It's full of architect-designed houses, got a few state, early state ones in there, not the ones you're familiar with, but much earlier. Um, and so what's happened is it's been held uh, and, and the places have survived and it's got this degree of intactness and integrity that I think people still see. But you still need the, like, the character on the edges and, and that's one of the problems is that if you take away, for instance, character, how do you get to the historic heritage? Thank you. But that's a good example. Thank you. All right, next. It looks like I'm delegated to second position. Right. Um, I'm not going to read out even my summary statement, which is only two pages long. You'll be relieved anyway. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. Um, I think Queen's Avenue has got strong merit to be considered as a historic heritage area. Um, taking out that very modern block in the north side of the street um, that Ms. Callaway has provided a, a, a map with the boundaries, suggested boundaries. It was part of the Jolly Farm. Um, when Thomas Jolly died, um, his widow Mary apparently gifted, we haven't, I haven't got the transaction evidence, but she probably gifted a lot of those areas, the Queen's Avenue area, so south of the junction of the two railway lines, the east and south railway lines, um, gifted blocks of that to her offspring so that daughter Alice got the Kalani Road end um, the two spinster daughters got the Lake Road end and that's where they lived for quite a, quite a few decades um, Frank Jolly built Windermere which not only looks over the lake which Roa, but looks over Frankton which was his domain as, as mayor and 
then the other, and Thomas, his brother, so Thomas Jr., um, also built a grand house on his piece of land, and subsequent to all of that, they then subdivided. So each of the offspring, and Mary herself, subdivided and subdivided more of the farm into residential lots with intent. And she, it was Mary who actually faced the um, Franklin Council, or Franklin Town Board initially, um, with the name Queen's Avenue, you know, to put that forward as a dedicated street. Um, and in honour, presumably, of Queen Victoria. Um, I haven't checked that, but presumably. Um, so that, and some of it, if you look at the satellite view or the um, um, boundary maps view, you can see those strong divisions between the between those um, parcels of land that belonged to, belonged to the, each of the offsprings, offspring, the siblings. Um, they're still there. And from looking at the title evidence, most of those small residential lots per subdivision were built on within a few years of their gaining title. And that's where you get the consistency, to use Mr. Knott's um, desired criterion, um, consistency of the appearance of a lot of those um, houses. Not entirely. There are some distinctive areas that were not built on for a long time. But um, so Frank Jolly's house, although it is off the road, it, its street address is Queen's Avenue and is part of it, and that house is already scheduled in the um, operative district plan. So that to me is the, the, the story behind the street, part of the histories um, that was occupied by a range of um, occupa uh, people with a range of occupations, um, not necessarily upper class, some of them were probably middle class, if we have those sorts of things in New Zealand, some were um, working class, tradesmen, um, shop owners, those sorts of people. So. It's not, um, it's good housing. It was quality housing, basically, at that period. And I disagree with Mr. Knott that he thinks that it is not representative of the late Victorian and Edward, Edwardian and during and after interwar growth development period. Um, I think that it is, absolutely, within that development period. Um, I would like to sit, no. Okay, swallowing myself there. So, um, but I do recommend that an addition, additional evaluation be carried out in Queen's Avenue, focusing on the area's architectural and historic value to the city against the criteria for HHAs. And it has potential to be protected and I would like to see it be protected. <coughs> here is Williams again. Mr. Weir. Hello. Um, I live on Queen's Avenue, known in the past as Frankton Hill and once considered to be the dress circle of Frankton. When I moved to Hamilton 10 years ago, I was struck by what uh, would have once been uh, cohesive and charming streetscapes of period houses, scarred and compromised by arbitrary and piecemeal infill housing. Heritage consultants engaged by uh, Hamilton Council had this to say about the city's state of heritage preservation. It's clear that the proposed HHAs are vulnerable to change and loss of heritage value by inappropriate modern development. If the opportunity is not taken now to protect them, there is the risk of the heritage values of Hamilton City being irretrievably damaged within the foreseeable future, possibly within the period as short as the next 10 years. Now, I know that we can't turn back the clock, but I hope that the, that the tide of intrusive and visually confronting developments can at least be held at bay by promoting what little is left of Hamilton's history-rich older houses and protecting them as tangible examples that helped shape and now reflect the progress of urbanisation in this city's early 20th century. In particular, I propose that the remaining period houses on Queen's Ave be classified as part of a new historic heritage area to acknowledge the street's important role in the, in the creation of Frankton. 
Much of Franklin once belonged to the local farmers, the Jollies. The suburb takes its name from Frank, um, Thomas and Mary's son, and he and his siblings inherited it all were gifted farmland land on Franklin Hill, which they progressively subdivided. Frank's heritage listed homestead at 39 Queens Ave still stands today, overlooking Lake, Ro Lake Rotoroa, and a farmyard fence line dividing two paddocks and radiating from the lake now takes the form of diagonal boundary lane lines between several properties, including ours, at the Kalani Road end of the street. Um, there's a number of bungalows in the street which share similar detailing, highly likely to be examples of the work of one or, or other of several house building companies that were prolific in the Waikato in the early 1900s. There's a striking example of Edwardian architecture at number seven, which along with its neighbour at number nine might soon be listed as heritage buildings. And there's a couple of arts and crafts style cottages, including our place at the Kalani Road end of the street. And our end of the street is noticeable too as a rare example of being part of a government sponsored soldiers settlement area, normally reserved for rural areas. A second council-engaged consultant cited lack of streetscape cohesiveness as damaging Queen's Ave's chances of an HHA status, as the street has indeed been blighted by the demolition of some of its original houses and by their replacement with medium-density developments of aesthetic banality. But as you've read and have heard um, from submissions from my fellow consultants here, we've provided detailed heritage and historical research reports, analyses and assessments that prove even in its current state, large sections of Queen's Ave helped tell the story of early Hamilton and are worthy contenders to be classified as an HHA. As Hamilton's importance grows regionally and nationally, housing intensi intensification is unavoidable. However, sanctioning the destruction of still more of the city's period homes will lead to entire neighbourhoods suffering architectural amnesia and, like the fate of Eleanor Rigby, left with no signposts to point to their histories and lives lived. If continued unabated, the sacrifice and decimation of older inner-city inner neighbourhoods, which now provide life-enhancing physical, emotional and cultural links to the city's layered past, is tantamount to taking an ice pick to the collective consciousness of Hamilton's wider community and lobotomizing its history. I therefore urge Council to, to seriously consider zoning sections of Queen's Ave as a historic heritage area before it's too late. Thank you, Mr Weir. Um, you'll leave a copy of your uh, uh, statement there for us, won't you? Any? No, I haven't got any questions, thank you. <clears throat> I mean, what you're advocating is very clear. Um, mm. We just need to have a think as to whether that's practicable in terms of where we're currently at. So thank you for producing the material. Mm. And the photographs are really, really helpful. So thank you for the Great. photographs. And thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, we're now going to take a break from Heritage. You need something. So that's right. Yes, right. Um, we will resume at quarter past one. Yes, sorry. No, no, I'm looking at Steve. What's the? Two minutes. Oh, you're very welcome. If, uh, two minutes is what you're proposing. Yeah, well, we'll have them. <clears throat> Lachlan, these are these are great. Can, oh, good. Can, can they be turned out over the dinner break for for four copies? Of course. So, Miss Clark, Miss Clark, is it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. And sorry, Steve had told me earlier, but I'd completely right, forgotten sorry. about that. So, um, welcome. I live on Met uh, and Met I Street, corner of uh, 19 Met I Street, in the corner left. Here. Um, just to do with uh, restrictions now to do with the HHA yeah. is to do with shedding. So um, what I really need and want is some sort of shedding um, in the same style as my house. So I was going to get a small weatherboard one done. Um, but I'm told that, well, I can still get one built, but I have to do a resource consent. Mm. So, oh, mine is mainly to do with um, 
you know, the extra cost if you've got say that. Really. Yes. And then oh my grandson said just just build one. But then I made an inquiry and said, No, you can't, you can't. So I suppose I've just had to reconsider and and um, it was suggested to me too that um, it would devalue our properties, you know, if it was HHA. Can you comment on that? <coughs> well, <there's>, uh, <coughs> there are two arguments with respect to HHAs. One is that it devalues, and the other is that it adds value. And, and I mean, that's a sort of a market issue at the time and the yeah. state and so on and so forth. So. I mean, it can swing both ways depending on what's going on, obviously. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no guarantees, as you know, with real estate, not at all. Um, <clears throat> but yes, you're not alone in terms of being concerned about the provisions that might apply or do mm. apply if it's uh, if it's confirmed as an HHA. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm not. Sure. We can't give you any comfort on that uh, issue. No. Um, I'm not sure we can offer you any free advice in just looking yeah. at your. Um, your property here. Mm, yeah. It's a corner property which might make it a bit tricky but um, yeah. you've got some options. Okay. Mm. Um, so I can go ahead and get the shed as long as I do a resource permit. <coughs> well, <laughs> we can't advise you on that. Oh. I think um, <coughs> um, you'll need to talk to council as to whether or not okay. that's a requirement or not, I think. Uh, yeah, okay. So maybe have a conversation outside. Yeah. Maybe. Um, Mr. Knott has a comment as well. There is uh, an amended rule in the um, track change copy of the chapter 19 that's before you, and that um, includes the ability, and now I've immediately lost it, so bear with me, um, allows um, as permitted activity the erection of a garden shed no greater than seven square metres located to the rear of the existing dwelling mm -hmm. and no more than 2.2 metres high. So that wasn't in there previously, so recognising people's concerns regarding sheds, that, that oh, rule is being yeah. proposed yeah. Um, at this stage. <coughs> but that's not a notified rule and therefore it has no effect. No, that's no, right. No, no immediate yeah. effect. It's, it's yeah. before you rather than being yeah. a, a, an existing rule. Yeah. Oh, um, so you can't do it at the moment because it's not in the plan as, as, okay. as notified, but depending on where we go, you might be able to if we decide oh, on okay. that rule. So, so it might reconsider and then just put so a restriction I guess, I guess the, the, issue, the issue for you is when were you planning or hoping to be able to remove the shed? Not, not to, this week? No, I'll right. Have to, right. oh, to build the shed. No, I've converted um, one of my bedrooms uh -huh. in my house, so that's right. my garage. I'd really like to have a shed <laughs> so I can have my bedroom back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Oh, so that's a possibility then. A possibility. Yeah. Yes. Oh good. Yes. Okay. Right. That's about it. Thank you. That was my <laughs> All right. Concern, Thank you shed. very much. And uh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad we got you in before we broke. So Thank that's, you. That's good. Thank you very much. Right.
Resume. Thank you very much. Mrs. Morgan. Hi. Nice to see you at last. Right. I don't want to be here. Right. Well, you, you tell us what you want to tell us. Well, I'm pretty proud of to be quite honest. Because mm -hmm. this has been going on over a year now, and this in it's in AIDS. Nobody could tell me what, what it was, who the hell started it off, or anything. Mm -hmm. I want to know what's it got to do with my property. You're at 76 Ehrlich Ave. Yes, could you speak up, please? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. 76 Ehrlich Ave, that's, that's, right. that's your property, thank you. Just bring it up on the map. So what's your interest in my property? Uh, we don't personally have any interest in your property, Ms Morgan. We're, in, we're, we're independent commissioners. We're not council. We're just here to... to well, who started this to be interested in my property? Well, <coughs> obviously uh, that came about through council and, and through the... Uh, Why? The, well, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question because I don't know the answer to the question. Well, who you're, does? Just a minute. You're, you're here today to tell us why it is that you, you think the SNAs shouldn't be applied to your property. And I come here to find out why anybody is interested in my property to start with. And I think I need that answer. Well, that's not an answer I can give you. Who could give it to me then? <clears throat> Nobody there. Well, a council may, may be able to, but that's, that's outside of this, uh, this Then why am I here for, if nobody can tell me? Um, I've tried for over a year to find out about this. I've, co I've come and got people there. People have come to my place from the city council, and nobody can tell me anything. Well, can you help us by telling us uh, what it is about your property that you think the SNA shouldn't be put over? What is it? What is it about? That's my property, not yours. Just, <clears throat> all right. So it's. So we're not really talking about whether or not the vegetation exists on your property or not. We're talking about whether anyone has a right to, to put something over your property. Yep. Why would you do that? Well, I think we're going around in circles here. All right, well, I'll start then. All right. When I bought my property 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it was a swamp. Nobody wanted it. We bought it because we could see potential in it. Mm -hmm. It was flooded. People were using it for a dump. It stunk. The first time we saw it, we had to use gum boots from, from the pathways going along the driveway there. We had to use gum boots just to get on the property because nobody wanted it. And I, could, I had a look at it, and I thought, we could do something with this. Now, we were milking cows at Matangi for Dave O'Brien for 17 years, and we'd saved a bit of money, and all we wanted to do was have a home of our own, which we had no chance of getting if we'd been living in town. And so we went on that farm for 17 years, and we saved the money. And we bought it off Mr. Ehrlich for $5,000. And what we bought was a swamp that everybody used for a dump. And it took us two years to clean it and clear it up before we could even do anything on it. It was a lot of hard work. And from, this, from the footpath, I had to build a road 45 meet, meters long just to get onto the property because it was such a long driveway. And that took me two years. And my husband worked in town and I did that along with the kids. Now my whole idea was to have a property so that we could have a foster home, so we could look after all our foster kids. And that was the whole idea of that place. It wasn't to make money out of it or anything like that. It was going to be a home for us and our Maori foster kids. And the first thing we did was try and clear all the water off and then try to put fences up. So it wasn't to keep the kids in, it was to keep people out. Because in those days, Maori kids were treated terrible. They really were. That was my whole idea of my husband and I. And that's what we did for many years after we cleaned the property. And the property took us two years to take all the floods out, to block all the drains up. We even had to bust the school bath water, the big swimming pool. And they piped that through onto our property and the water kept coming back and back. And the city council had two drains on it that we had to get fixed up before we could even start doing the water. And that took us a long time. We worked very hard on that property. We had to do, you have no idea how hard we worked. At night, after we'd finished milking at six o'clock, we'd come in and do it. And on our days off, we worked very hard for that property. 
and over the years we've developed it. Yes, I plant all the trees and everything else. So I want to know now why are the trees of an interest to you? Because I assume that's about the only thing on the property that's worth anything. Underneath your trees, Mrs Morgan, uh, is, <clears throat> is there like an understory or is it mown grass? Pardon? Underneath your big trees, which I can see on a, on a plan, yeah. Is it a mown lawn no, under the trees, or no, is it? You can't mow. You can't have grass under no. there because the trees. There's um, all sorts of trees there, and they drop the leaves down, yes, yeah. and there's no way to mow. Yeah. I will just spend years. Just the magnolia tree alone is huge. Mm. I planted that, and it's absolutely huge now. Right. And we've also got um, uh, a fir tree that sheds, and the whole area that. It's just sort of leaves and stuff like that. And every now and again we have to rack them all up, especially the magnolia leaves. If I'd known what I know now about magnolias, I wouldn't have planted it because you can't no. burn magnolia leaves. You've got to rack them all up and put them over in the swamp. Yes, yeah, so very, very wa do. waxy leaves, aren't they? Oh, they drive mm. you crazy. And they still drive me crazy. Mm. But that's what you do when you have trees. But the thing was, with those trees that I planted, um, <coughs> Oh. Mm. And um, is there any sort of special bird life and what have you? Oh in the yes, we've trees? got. We have magnificent bird life. In fact, we've got at least ten pet birds that we feed on the porch that come up when we call them. We've got blackbirds. We've got thrushes. We've got magpies. Um, we've got some other birds that have just moved in that, that have got uh, very sparkly. Um, Feathers are not a cut, I don't even know what they're called. We've got a lot of bird life and we've got a lot of blackbirds that we feed. They come up on the porch, we've, we've got little kitten biscuits, very tiny kitten biscuits and they just love them. Right. And sit, they wait for us every morning and we have about 10 of those birds. They're wild birds, we don't, we don't pet them or anything like that but they follow us around all day and we've got um, fantails. We seem to get an awful lot of um, Birds are coming and they stay. <coughs> it's it's lo lovely in the morning listening to them. Well, they're not silly, are they? Pardon? I said they're not silly, no, are they? But it's obviously a good place for them. I have two two buckets inside. One is for for the um, um, compost, and the other one is for the birds. And I separate them out. The bird ones we put all the bread and biscuits and all that sort of thing stuff that we know birds like. And the compost ones, we just put all the peelings and stuff like that because birds don't like anything like that. They don't like tomatoes, they don't like pumpkin. There's so many things they don't like, so we have a separate bucket for them and we feed them just about every morning. Magpies have just moved in about six months ago and they're magnificent birds. They really and truly are. I just love them. I'd hate anything to happen to them. <coughs> Mr. Morgan, I don't, I don't get the idea that you're going to remove your trees or do anything like that. That doesn't sound very likely, does it? Of course, it's not. No. Never. <clears throat> no. Never. So, so let me we've ask. Got trees around the back too yeah, that the birds right. love. Yep. So let me ask you. I mean, I understand that you're concerned um, that there's been a layer put on a map which is over your over your land. In terms of what that layer is supposed to achieve, which is the protection of, of the vegetation and allow for bird life and corridors and so on, do you have an issue with that? Do you have a pro do you have a problem with, with what the no. what the person no I didn't No, I just did. couldn't get out nobody told me why you were interested. There's no <coughs> way I cut the trees out. Yeah. You've got trees all around the place. Yeah. Cut. The only trees that I regret planting are the tune trees. Nobody told me that when I got them down the gully, I'd have to keep cutting the grass and the toon trees that come up. Otherwise, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, now I know that particular problem. So, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the purpose of the SNA is obviously to protect, you know, the, the <clears throat> protect the vegetation, way, huh? protect the bird life, protect, allow, yeah. uh, allow for bat manoeuvring and so on through the areas. That's the purpose of it. That's well, not a, that's not that. a that's not a purpose that you have any problem with, I don't no, think. No, of course not. No. I would do when I die. That's the only thing that worries me. I'm 92 now, and what worries me is what's going to happen to my birds and mm. all those sort of things. Mm. I want, I really want 
the Maori Trust and Higgins Road to take the whole property over because I know they won't cut down any trees mm. and I know they'll treat the land with respect. And that's all I want. Mm. I never bought that land with the idea of making money out of it, ever. Mm. I know it's worth a great deal now and that, that worries me because money is nothing. Mm. It's a property <coughs> as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> and, the, and the SNA putting over that area doesn't, doesn't, doesn't compromise what you want for that land doesn't do anything bad to it, it just, just no, recognises what you're doing, basically. Well, I was uh, hoping you would say that, because mm. I don't want anything cut down, because yeah. there's, there's not only those trees there, there's trees all around the property that are planted. Mm. And we've got fruit trees, and we've got... Um, what are those trees I planted for the bellbirds, do you? Oh, oh God. All sorts of trees. Yeah, I've got all sorts of trees for the birds to eat of uh, mm. strawberry trees. Mm. The bellbirds really love those. Mm. And we've got all other sorts of trees. We've planted a lot. Magnolia tree is the only one that um, nobody seems to like very much. <coughs> it was lovely when it was... When they it like was the small. flowers. They like the flowers. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> yep. But it's <coughs> huge now. A rare, and it, it dominates mm. just about all the top of the gully. So let me ask you, let me ask you what... What do you think putting the SNA over your property, what's the worst thing it can do for you? What are you, what are you, what are you really worried about in terms of... I'm not worried of about anything. I didn't know what, what you were going to talk about, that's all. You right. just didn't really understand what it actually What the does. SNA does. Yeah, what it actually does. I tried right. now that we know. all year to find that out, yeah. and I couldn't find it out. Yeah. And then when Charlotte came and had a look at the property and was very interested in the trees, I thought, well, that's what she's interested in. Mm. So mm. I figured out that must be what... Was a SNA. <coughs> well, now that we know that it's a resource, um, it's a protection resource mm. rather than a you guys trying to tell my mother what to do, then we're quite happy with that. <coughs> well, I'm more than happy because I don't want to see the trees go. No. And, but the only thing is, I'm not sure what's going to happen. If the Maori Trust take it over, I'll be very happy about that. Because mm. mm. that means well, it'll all continue. Yeah. I think so. Could I um, say I might just have a word with yes. the submitter? I think so. I think it would be helpful just to just to reconfirm what we've just been talking about because I don't I don't think there's a problem for you. I think um, I, do, I don't think there's a problem for you. I, I think you, what you want to happen and what council wants to happen is pretty thing. much the same thing. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, just confirm that. Maybe have a conversation outside on that. Just just see what other information you actually need. Well, that's yeah. See. Being 92, and I'm pretty sprightly, I still cut my lawns, I still cut wood, I still do all that. We pick up the wood that's fallen down and we use it for the fire and that. And my, my section, the whole lot is clean, there's no rubbish on it or anything like that. Mm. It's a very, very clean section. And what I want is somebody to take it over and just keep it that way. Because mm. I would hate those birds to lose their home. I really would, especially my pet birds, because they just... Well, I think, we think they're pet birds, but they're not, they're wild birds. But they you, come no, up because they, right. they like yeah. us. You're the pet. Yeah, and you, they come yeah. up and they mm. eat out of our hands, and they're just not, but, and when people come up, if, as long as they're sitting on the porch and don't move around, they'll come up. And everybody that comes up, you know, they really love them. And they're big birds, and now that we've got the magpies in there now, and they're magnificent, absolutely beautiful birds, and they sing every morning, they sing. And so do the toys when they come. Yep. Uh, sorry, I'm waffling on, but I really <coughs> can't fine. tell you about how much I really love those birds. Yep. Well, it's nice to see you. Thank, thank you Thanks for making the effort. Really appreciate awesome. it. Yep. yep. Take a pause. <coughs> sorry about waffling on a bit. But oh, I you're do, entitled to waffle. I do love That's my right. <laughs> And my trees. <laughs> yes. And your section, by the sounds of it. Oh, the whole lot. We worked very hard for it. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Mrs. Morgan. Right. <clears throat> we'll just take five minutes, everybody, and we'll just... Uh,
Not you again, Laura, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Come on up, come on up. Yep. Of course. <clears throat> So, yes. so, 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 so which of the which is the evidence? We, is this the Callaway Family Trust that we're now looking yes, at? Yes, that's right. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is Bob. You've got two there. You've got uh, one two one Myrell Road, mm -hmm. which is the Callaway Family Trust, and then there's Nine Weaker Street, which is Alan Callaway. Right. Which is in the railway. Which one would you like first? I'm going to be very quick. <coughs> you just fire away. Yeah. Well, shall I follow on from this lovely lady that's talking about her trees? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, which, which is 121 Myrall Road. Uh, so, so my father's uh, about to approach 90, and uh, he still feels <clears throat> sprightly, but he apologises, it's just a little bit too much for him. That's fine. Yeah. And uh, he had an SNA <clears throat> put over the property at 121 Myrall Road. And he was perhaps a bit like this uh, lady that was here. Uh, he wasn't certain what was going on and he also missed the consultant coming to look at it. And so wrote the consultant a very nice letter and said, hang on a minute, I've lived here for 65 years and these are my fruit trees and I've got lovely co in the front, but the SNA is over my fruit trees. Um, <laughs> and what's happened after that is they did actually come out and in the proposal, they've actually removed the SNA off his property. And so the letter is just saying that he supports that, and he does actually support SNAs. Um, but, uh, right. It's Tracy, a little bit too big at the moment. Yep, good. <laughs> Out the front. Okay. Um, so, so he's quite comfortable now. Yes, yes. Uh, I think he was happy either way. So he'd already made the decision um, that if it was in, that was fine. Um, but it was his driveway, and it was actually a hill, not a gully. Right. <laughs> and an eight metre high <clears throat> grapefruit fruit tree. Right. Okay. Good. Right. The, the second one is, is Alan Calloway, who lives in uh, Weaker Street in Frankton in the railway village, and he apologises. He's a painter, um, so, so hasn't been able to be released from work. He's lived there for over 30 years, and his family have grown up there, and he's, uh, as you might imagine, part of the community. And he was very concerned because uh, the notification for what was being proposed, he didn't get what was going on. And it was very quick, and the neighbours didn't understand either. And so his uh, talk there is just to say, um, you know, it, it wasn't a great process at all. Uh, and. Uh, that, that's uh, why people were angry. Uh, but he walked around his neighbours late that night and, and spoke to them. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether anyone put a submission in, but there was a little bit of confusion because they already thought it was a historic heritage area. Right. So um, he's been watching, of course, the place um, for the last 30 odd years, and he's just noting there that um, most people now have a garage in their backyard, in fact, almost all. Uh, sometimes a three-car garage, you know, because the little houses are quite small. Um, but what's been also happening is that over time, the house is being brought in. And so while there's an imagining the, that it's looking fairly intact, when you look at the number of houses now on the ground compared to the one house, quarter acre, 800, whatever it was, square metre section, there, there's quite a lot of infill going on, including mm. subdivision at the back and he was concerned about the rules, and more recently someone's uh, pulled in a, a three-storey transportable home and put it in someone's backyard, and that's uh, causing a bit of concern in the neighbourhood. So um, he, he'd just like um, to confirm that he'd like uh, historic heritage to remain over um, the area. Uh, he supports that everyone's included in it, uh, including the parks, and uh, he's got a particular passion for the uh, railway memorial trees, as have a number of the residents in uh, Wicker Street, which back onto these particular trees, and uh, they'd actually like to see them acknowledged under notable trees. But they haven't been identified as such. Okay. Thank you. Can Thank I just you. clarify, yeah. Alan Calloway, 
related to you or just a similar? He's my brother. <laughs> I, should, I, I should have done that, you know, if you take your hat off and you go like... <laughs> yeah. You may also find that, that, that um, the, the little book on architecture that's used in the HHAs, that's actually my dad at 121 Myrall Road, who wrote that history of um, Hamilton buildings. It's a passion that runs in the family. So uh, we've got different passions, but yeah. um, they just couldn't be here today. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, the house looks fabulous, doesn't it? This, this is the photo of Nine Wicker. Oh, it's, Nine, it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it needs some maintenance. Yeah. He'd admit that he's a painter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, you can, you can see that, that's right. Yes, yes no, th there's, there's mm. no money in the Heritage Fund, and the Heritage Fund doesn't support uh, maintenance within the HHAs. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you for that. Right, finally, we PHZ, Hu Hang Zhang. Yeah. Right. Sub three, sub three, twenty. Okay, this is a family trust, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Family okay. Trust. Right. Thank you. Right. Where you go? Right. Um. My name is Pu Han Zheng. I'm just a director of PHC Family Trustees Limited. Um, as capacity of the PHC Family Trust. And first of all, I appreciate the Hamilton City Council, all staff, legal supporter, expert effort, um, and acknowledge the positive intention behind Plan Change Night. My property, oh, there's no, right. <laughs> my property, at 29 Thackeray Street, Hamilton Lake. That's a fee simple property having 809 square meters, more or less land. And I, were, I purchased it in 2015. Then I transferred it to my family trust, the PHC family trust, and the year before, 2021. At the time when I purchased it in 2015, the property itself was generally in a very, very poor condition. It was uh, dilapidated and on the verge of collapse. Without the renovation th thoroughly, um, we have finan financed in the last seven years, the property will likely have already gone. So we actually up uplifted the property file from ha Hamilton City Council no architecture drawing has been included in the property file. There are only two documents in total, four pages. One document regards to stormwater pipe, and another one is just plumbing work permit. So we actually, our submission was submitted on the 19th of August last year. We have made analysis why 28th Decker Street, my property, does not qualify as historical heritage and is therefore not a proper qualifying matter for the purpose of the um, Amendment Act and MPSUD. And I, I, we do believe we have a proper basis to seek removal from heritage cl classification um, for this property as imposed uh, by Plan Change 9. The property should be removed as a built heritage. I, I think to de define my property uh, as a built heritage, what, what we found is our, there's no proper procedure being conducted. There's no proper consultation were conducted. No remedy, no compensation have been ever discussed. The assessment has not been um, accurately and inappropriately done. So, um, as I said, um, this property is a, an estate in Fee Simple. Both, oh well, I, I actually, we, I, I personally, I spend a bit of time, done the research, investigation, I drafted 
19 page just long submission attached with the whole of the annexures and plus um, your Hamilton City Council prescribed form that's in total around 60 pages. I don't, I'm not going to just talk about everything, the law, the application, the conclusion, or just briefly wish uh, all commissions, no, uh, sorry, I didn't say hello to the <laughs> just, even though I'm, I'm doing uh, legal work, I'm still a bit, um, feel, feel a bit awkward, this is for my own interest, mm -hmm. so I just um, forgot to say hello, sorry, um, straight away entered into the topic. Um, but this property is really, um, it's not just about the building, it, it's a big piece of land, I think it's rarely seen in, in city now. Both international law, domestic law, you know, pri protect private interest, gives the landlord the right to full use, enjoyment of the property without any interference from the other. This is a basic principle. I don't mind, you know, we really wish to, well, when, when we raise the issue, we wish to protect this building or protect it, but um, we need to do, run through the whole of the things through the proper, proper way. So if a, a heritage covenant really cannot be agreed upon arbitrarily without proper consultation according to the act. We have a several, a few act talking about this. And also there, there must be a mutual agreement reached in regards to the consent for the property to be listed in the heritage covenant. Uh, also section 82.4 of OCO Government Act also set up clearly principles of the consultation. Well, we really, again, appreciate council protecting all heritage or nature environment, private rights must still take priority over public actions. We, as landowner, we can't be de deprived of any use or enjoyment of our own land and feature on the land and have any limitation imposed on our rights without proper consultation. If um, the consultation procedure really in the a right way, it must be clearly set up how to um, how do you consult with an interest party, how do you negotiate it with private owner, what is reasonable compensation or remedy for the landowner, and so on, so on. And, the protection procedure also should be clearly set up, informed owner, why to protect, what to pre protect, how to protect, and um, what the government support and contribution to protect. So during the whole time, I think this, this, this matter has running through for quite a bit long time. We only received three letters from Hamilton City Council. They were not consultation and didn't really propose to arrange consultation, but were just decision already made by the council. No proper consultation has ever been made with, um, between the council and the owner, and no proper procedure has been followed or um, implemented to fully inform the landowner, even provide a proper aid, compensation, and or remedy, it seems the council is forcing the landowner to accept their decision without any reserva reservation. That's what we actually think, like the, the lady, two of the ladies, they don't know what's going on there. Why? What's happening? We haven't been through all of the things. We just suddenly receive a letter, say, oh, we want to do this. We want to do that. That's not right. I don't think it's right at all. And we also understand the protection of historical heritage from improper subdivision use and development is a matter of nation, na national importance in the Section 6 F of RMA. We do understand that, but we can't really simply walk around the things which belong to the others and come to say, wow, this thing is so, it's a bit unique, rusted, old, three levels, oh, okay, let's protect it. And then, who's going to pay for it? Nobody says, oh, we're not sure. 
Let's just put burden on the landowner. Do it. I don't think that's the right way to whatever, doing it. Even council people doing so much effort, times I looked at the whole of the plan, a um, summation, I mean, several hundred pages. I report hence several hundred pages. Is it gonna do, anybody gonna to read it? Can read, can understand that? I don't think people can, could understand the scheme and the principle underneath it at all, such as uh, the old ladies' trees, when they bought the property, trees there. Well, that's their property. Why you come out to protect it? They, they got their own self-conscious to protect it. Why will council come out have to say, oh, let's protect it. Are you going to pay for it? Don't cut it, don't touch it. That's the way we want to protect it. I don't think that's, that's right at all. No person is to be deprived of the use and enjoyment of the person's property without any just compensation at all. If, well, we say it is necessary to identify my property or, or property as built heritage, which would consequently limit the use of our own land and make us responsible for the maintenance and the protection of the building. The government ought to provide a remedy and support for doing so. And this is, must be consulted first, negotiated first, and agreed first by the parties. Not just simply we as a one government authority say, let's do it. But nobody knows what is going on there. And in identify, in other words, well, in identify my property as having um, built heritage value, heritage value, no one has actually never entered the building, nor done a physical inspection of the property. We believe that council only probably conducted what they stated in the letter using documents, photographs, maps. We don't even know what documents, photographs the council used for identifying my property as a built heritage. Well, this um, 28th Sacred Street was assessed against uh, heritage assessment criteria in the report. All, every criteria says merely low, unknown. There's no even high, well, historical quantity, physical, architecture quantity, group values, technology quantities, um, archaeological, uh, maybe not pronunciation right. Archaeological, yes. Right. Unknown, oh, right. everything's unknown. Then finally, define it. That's good heritage, let's protect it. So, but the, so the plan still pro proposed to add my property as a built heritage. I just feel, well, uh, I was really frustrated about this. So actually the home was built um, in, um, well, from the data in January 1926. Well, the earliest convincing reference of the property that was in 1924. However, the report, uh, assessment report says the area is known to have occupied pre or to 1900. So it may have some archaeological significance. And it was really, the report prepared so many pages and uh, conflict each other and so much unknown information then defined. Well, my property was defined as good heritage. And plain change night appears to be what I understand overreaching by attempting to classify older house, housing like um, my property, 28th Sacred Street, as a historical built heritage, simply because it is old. And therefore, assert this is a qualifying matter and uh, uh, intensification regime required by the Resource Management Act. And also in the PSUD, regardless 
whether there is no, well, there, there's a structure plan, the drawing of property, and the house actually has been significantly renovated inside, and it was all different. Now, it's not a something what we can protect for at all. <coughs> I, there was, um, I think, 18th of August, 2022, I submitted my submission online. Then, later on, one week later, I received a letter from Hamilton City Council that stated 19 August 22 from Hamilton City Council inform us this property is now in the proposed plan change 12. This is a, a particularly apparent considering the property is situated right next to the commercial district. My property is sitting in the middle, this side, fully de newly developed new apartment, and this side, and then the chamber, well, which commercial property around, looks just normal general. My one looks pretty general. And several houses away, it's full high-level uh, apartments. Only the house, my house on the street, on this area, is supposed to be defined as built heritage, or what I, I really don't, don't understand. Why? In well, um, the well, I think the the actually the purpose and function of change, uh, plan change nine in twelve, appear to contradict each other. Well, to my particular matter, I'm not talking about the others, or just my property. Well, looks like okay, you ended this, protect it. But you are still in the plan change 12. Well, it's really unreasonable and incongruous for the property to be subject to plan change 9, considering my property is so close, in, uh, close proximity to urban development. It's my concern. When I bought this property, I used it as my branch office. And this is a commercial area. And it doesn't look different at all. I didn't think, oh, one day government will protect it. And uh, my building only occupied so small part of my land. I do believe if you try to protect the property, you try to actually limit the use of my building, well, don't knock it, maintain it, and I can't actually do anything about my land at all. This, this is nothing what I feel going to be reasonable. I, I got a, my private, absolutely indivisible interest in it. So we, uh, both me and my little colleague, we travel from Auckland today and return straight away back to the speak 10 minutes. I do not really wish we just come to here, say, speak a 10 minutes like a speech, <laughs> then, well, procedurally, not really probably gave us, gave, gave anybody any in, in impression, then we'll have to go forward to run through whole of the matter in the ju ju judicial system. This, uh, I don't think that's going to be, look so good because I, I really appreciate people Council, expert, legal person, commissioner, you saw the effort and intention in it. But for any particular matter, what I, I personally believe, if anything in the public, on the public side, if you want to protect it, protect it. But if it's on the personal own land, you can't actually say, let's protect it. Okay, do not touch it before you're doing that. Talk with people, talk to them fairly, and have a negotiation. How much do you want to contribute for? And how much do you compensate for those people? That old, old lady, I feel so innocent. My tree, my land, and I bought it so many years, 50 years. Then people come out, jump out, say, protect your trees, and they can't touch it. Even she has herself, <clears throat> you know. I think we're moving a little bit off point yeah, here. Yeah, well, well, that's just my feeling. Well, yep, I can well, see that. I feel this is not mm. right. 
Well, um, the reason I bought a Hamilton um, property is because I've been living in the city for five years. And I feel Hamilton is such a beautiful city with a, you know, a council, Hamilton council, very efficient. When I was here, an intelligent council. So I sincerely wish council commissioner to consider my submission and sincerely wish you to try to look at this particular matter at least to see whether it's worth to protect and why. And if I welcome you, come back to talk to me. If you identify my building, say, wow, it's so worthy to protect it. <coughs> it's protected. I can actually, I, I contribute myself. I can do it, but no one can persuade me now. So, but I thank you very much for your effort. Um, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> That's just, just what I wish to say. <coughs> thank you, Ms. Yang. Um, <coughs> yes. Um, now, just for your information, we're, <clears throat> we're not dealing with the specific built heritage issues until much later on in the year. <clears throat> I mean, it's fine that you've come and spoken to us about this now, and we'll, we'll take this one forward. But we're not actually hearing most of these on built heritage until September. So <clears throat> any decision we make will be well after September, towards the back end of the year, just, just for your information. Oh. Questions? No, I think... Um, <clears throat> You got your message across very clearly. <laughs> yes. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. No. no. All right. Well, thank Thanks. you both. Thank you. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Do you did, want to, did you want to come pick back up on some things? <clears throat> yeah, we'll give you a quarter of an hour if that's yep. fair enough. I think, I think that'll be um, plenty. Um, just, just uh, again, running through the list of things that I've highlighted from my notes, um, just to confirm that um, Mr Miller and myself did both correctly visit the, the um, Oxford Street East and um, area and, and did look at the right houses. Um, I can also confirm that in addition to that visit, um, I first visited on the 16th of July 2021, because that's when my photos of the houses are taken. So, um, yeah, definitely went to the right place. Um, just in terms of um, the, the comments that were made in relation to Oxford Street by um, Mr. White regarding the um, Ellis and Burnham houses, and also features of railway houses too. Um, just to say that um, the railway houses, for instance, most often you see them with vertically sliding sash windows that are that are in multi panes. But actually, there's an you know when you look around, there's actually a large number of casement windows. So there's various different designs of those. And equally with the Ellis and Bernard um, buildings, they, and I think I said this actually yesterday, they don't have the all have the flat weather boards, they have various different profiles depending upon um, when they were built and I, I presume really to, to be fair the budget of the, the person who was building them or, or commissioned them um, <coughs> and probably not of significant relevance today but um, because clearly the, the discussions moved on a bit in terms of the whole railway house thing where, where because of the um, the sort of categories we were using originally, um, the railway house thing came in, but there was a comment made that the railways wouldn't build railway houses so far away from where the lines were, um, which, um, as a matter of um, fact, is incorrect. If you actually look around the country, there's an awful lot of railway houses built nowhere near the railway, and if you look at Oakuni, for instance, um, Egmont Street there is about a K away from the railway, and uh, Sunshine Settlement in Tomo Anui is equally a similar distance away from the railway. So um, that's just a, a matter of fact that um, that was the case, but probably not that significant to you today. Um, so just rolling down the list. I think um, Lord Kellaway mentioned it would be good to have information as a guide for owners. Um, as to what can happen and what they can do and etc. 
um, if they're within an HHA, and I um, agree 100% on that, but that is not something that's been promoted at this stage as part of this plan change and something that I have responded to in my rebuttal evidence that uh, there's no reason the council couldn't bring that along later, but it's just not here today. But I agree that that would be very useful for um, people. Um, I think really there was a fair bit of discussion today coming out regarding the availability of information and, and um, how much information is um, needed. And I, and I guess equally, um, you know, how much is enough, but, it, but it, as equal, I think, really is, um, from my perspective, how much is too much information. And also a bit of a discussion, I think, regarding whether you should know that history before you go on site or whether you go on site and then go through the history. Just to confirm um, that in terms of the work that I've done, uh, at the same time as being commissioned, I was given an awful lot of information from the council. And um, I've been through the thematic history um, of Hamilton prepared by Lynn Williams. I've been through the um, European history of Hamilton prepared by Alice Morris, who was uh, one of the planners here, um, who, who covered historic heritage matters along with um, um, someone from the library who deals with the, the archive and heritage um, library. So they produced the paper, which I, I've been aware of, and equally the um, two reports by Lifescapes have both also included sort of background information. So. I did have all of that information at the same time as going on site, so it was a, a, a concurrent thing. It was a, it was a case that I wasn't visiting site with no knowledge of Hamilton. I was visiting site with uh, that uh, knowledge and understanding of Hamilton. Um, and likewise, um, as I think again came out in, in some of the, the comments I made yesterday, pulling upon my you know, 30 plus years experience of dealing with historic heritage, to, to make um, judgments as I'm going, um, as much as you know, making judgments back in the office afterwards in terms of the, the, the scoring that I uh, prepared. So um, I think it, it was interesting in terms of. Um, so I think it was uh, Miss Kellaway in terms of the question about um, Victoria Street and the. Um, the extent of a historic heritage area in Victoria Street and whether there's sufficient information um, available regarding that. And I think, um, just to, to say, uh, uh, Ms. Kelleway was sort of pointing back to, to the studies that were done in the 80s. Um, but, you know, just to confirm that, that clearly I've made the recommendations that, that I have in relation to that area based upon the work that I've done significantly more recently than that. So, um, you know, not to forget that, that there is a, a big piece of work that's been done since that. Um, I think there was a, some um, comments made, I think, by um, Ms. Williams regarding consistent, the consistency criteria. Um, and she's saying that, you know, areas that the consistency is suggested by myself, and I recognise that because, uh, as I pointed out, um, the other day, for instance, in relation to Hamilton East, the buildings within Hamilton East aren't 100% consistent. They were built over a, a, you know, a very long period, um, and that is a, an essential part of the heritage significance of that area, the way that it was developed then subsequently subdivided further and then further again. Um, but I think the important thing is is that when I was doing my scoring, I was aware of that issue. So, for instance, in terms of architecture, consistency isn't so important in Hamilton East as it would be in other areas. And I think that was something which, which is reflected when you, if you were to look at the street-by-street -street scoring that I carried out. Um, that's reflected in that. Then... Um, I think it was, it was interesting that in terms of the list of um, potential HHAs that, that Ms. Killaway listed that she felt she could support at this stage, um, I don't think she mentioned actually the one that she, oh no, she did mention Frankton East, yes, so Frankton East is on there. But I think it you know, didn't really include any of the newer HHAs. And I think 
that really may be because of the sort of step change that we're making with this work. And we, we discussed on Monday the fact that this is a new, almost, I guess, in, in some ways, um, streamline process we're going through. Um, but equally, we're looking at extending beyond those areas that have been traditionally um, identified as historic heritage areas, recognising those significance of those to the um, evolution and history of, of Hamilton as representative samples of the development periods that we're now working with, um, but also recognising that, 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 as we said, you know, people can look back in 40 years and say, when they, when they see the intensification that's happened on adjacent sites, you know, thank goodness that someone did have the foresight to recognise the significance of these areas before they were altered. Um, so I think ultimately the biggest question um, for me that's come out today is that whole issue of, uh, which I've already addressed um, a moment ago, is that whole issue of, of information. Do we have enough to um, recommend and these HHAs that you have before you? And I am clearly still of the opinion that we have a, a, enough information. I don't believe that some of the information, for instance, that we heard from Ms. Williams today in terms of you know, who, who ran a business out of each shop is interesting, but I don't think it's a deciding factor as to whether an area should be an HHA or otherwise. And I think there is a, we could go on forever researching information and we could end up with um, you know, something the size of a phone book, if any of us still remember what a phone book is. Um, for each HHA, but I don't think it would actually take us any further forward than we are today. I'm, as I said, 100% content that we have sufficient information available to make a judgment on for each area. And I think if we have any more, it will be, you know, too much and, and will actually muddy the water and confuse things further rather than providing clarification. <coughs> So I think that's um, all of the points that um, I've noted, but more than happy to um, answer any questions you have. <clears throat> I've got one if I could just mm -hmm. to kick off. In hindsight, do you believe it would have been possible to have maintained character areas and HHAs? Why are you still so convinced that moving away from character areas and only having HHAs is the best strategy? Well, we, I mean, the, the process I've been through has been to identify HHAs, not character areas, and I haven't sought to identify character areas. And, and I firmly stand behind those areas you have before you today as HHAs. So it's only consequential that the ones that were <coughs> character areas fall into your characterisation of an HHA, because you've brought them all through our yes. mass. And, 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 you know, the question has to be, long term, would a character area achieve what, what I believe should be achieved in this, which is the protection of those, you know, the, the wider significance of those areas, not just streetscapes. So let's explore that further. Are you saying that you felt that the current character area zoning have not protected those areas? I think they have to date to a great extent, but um, so what we're moving into a different stage, I think, now in a way, because there's a significantly greater pressure coming from lots of directions for intensification within urban areas. All right, thank you. And I think because of that, it's appropriate to stand back and think, um, let, let's study for HHAs because we know they will work effectively. So, so let's explore that a little further. Are, are you saying, is it your professional advice, that um, intensification, the, the likes of the MDRS, could occur in, um, uh, in areas that have been zoned character? Under the current operative district plan, are you saying that intensification, the likes of the MDR addresses, could occur? My experience with dealing with things at that level is more Auckland-based. 
where the courts have held that special character is more about streetscapes rather than about the whole range of things that historic heritage encompasses. No. Therefore, you could potentially have um, greater change within a special character area, I believe, than you would potentially get within a historic heritage area. But you are familiar with each of the rules that are attached to each of the current character zones that are in the operative district plan in Hamilton. I, I have looked at them. I couldn't tell you what they are at the moment in terms of the, in terms of the activity status for each thing. We do have something which has been started to come together. But I think fundamentally the, the difference is, notwithstanding what the rules are and the activity status are, one is a Section 6 matter, one is a Section 7 matter. And I think that's a fundamental difference. The fact that we have a um, you know, historic heritage is a matter of national importance is a huge step up in terms of the way you treat it, uh, a plan will treat it. So, as I said, my, my, the intention of the work that I did was to study Hamilton and to identify whether there was historic heritage areas within that area. If I was, if we accepted the argument in terms of the section six, I'm still wanting to get clarification because your justification for lifting these character zones up to an HHA, and I think, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but you have basically said it was to provide better protection. No, the, the, the reason they're uplifted to HHA status is because that they have satisfied my assessment that they should be HHAs. And therefore, there is an obligation under the Act to make the HHAs. Right. That's it. Ultimately, the starting point was to identify HHAs. So, um, so you're saying it doesn't really matter what they were called before. I mean, no. the fact that they were recognised like that made them obvious targets for study. Yeah. That's probably a starting point because they were areas of some existing heritage recognition, variably. Um, so they were a starting point. But the fact that they were carried areas is actually irrelevant, because you've, you've examined them from a point of view of Section 6. I've sort of ignored the fact they were, in a way. I mean, I knew they were, but I've sort of ignored it, in a way, because ultimately, it was just another thing to think about that I didn't need to think about. I had enough on my plate going and doing my assessments without thinking, what's this currently? And, and I've looked at every pre-1980 street, so I haven't confined my, or, or street that contains majority pre-1980 development, I haven't confined my study to existing areas that are somehow recognised. It's been a complete sort of blank sheet study in a way, if that makes sense, in terms of just looking at all of those areas. And as I said, um, I, ha I did put the current status to one side because it was just another, as I said, another thing to think about which I didn't have time to think about. It was just look at this, assess it, next one, look at this, assess it, bring it together and then we've gone through that process of carrying out more detailed um, research into each. I still want to drill down because I, I had heard you say in terms of HHAs that in light of the current pressure of intensification, um, I had understood you to say that by moving these particular, uh, I accept your argument that you're saying that you put all aside the character areas yeah. that they, uh, that they met your criteria for HHAs, and, right? Um, but I also understood you to say that one of your motive, that one of the reasons was in light of the level of intensification, that they would be somewhat more safer in HHAs. And so that's why I'm, I'm uh, did I misunderstand? No, I think, I think there's two points. What, one is, is, is in terms of the study I carried out, it was to look at HH, identify HHAs. So I, I guess on, on day one of the study, the study could have been formulated to identify special character. But a decision was made as a team that that wasn't what we wanted to do and that we, the study would be to identify historic heritage. 
So, so yes, I suppose that was a question on day one. Um, but, but actually, my um, professional opinion is that is that we took the right turn and, and, and we did identify historic heritage or look to identify historic heritage. So, are you saying, in light of that, that every other council that has both HHAs and character, uh, that they are not, that that's not an appropriate approach, or that they are, it is now outdated? I wouldn't like to say that only in so much as I'm on plan change 78 in Auckland and, and special character areas are an essential part of that. Right. And I think if I actually no, go I into that, I that may, that. it's probably not the best thing to do. I understand. I understand. <clears throat> what, um, <clears throat> what moved that initial discussion from special character to HHA? What was the, what was the sort of the policy thrust or the, or the initiative? Um, I mean, clearly, the, 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 a, a project, a project to identify historic heritage in Hamilton, whether it be you know potential HHAs and um, further buildings, as I understand, it's been on the cards for a long time, and, yeah. and it, it sort of reared up, and then there's been a change of council and a change of leadership in, in, in councillors, and it, it, it's, it's gone down and hidden for another three years, and then popped back up again. It's been a bit like that other thing over the past ten years, effectively, just depending upon political support. Um, and I think it was probably, as I understand it, probably two things. One, a, a council that's, that's, that's more open to the idea of it, and secondly, clearly we can't ignore um, what, you know, Plan Change 12 in Hamilton's terms coming forward. So I think that has really pushed the, the, the project forward. And but there, then, must have, there must have been a, a conversation amongst the professionals as to as to which was the best way to go. Though. Well, there was le there was legal advice provided regarding one oh, versus the other. Fault, isn't it? She preceded me actually, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's some legal advice regarding you know one versus the other, yeah. and I very much felt, from my professional opinion, it it was more appropriate to pursue HHA. So yes, there was a day one conversation, should it be SCA or HHA. Mm. But in terms of the work that I've then sort of did, sorry, it's all, yeah, it's got a bit confused, sorry, in terms of my response, sorry. It was day one, <coughs> but then immediately move on to HHA. <coughs> but it was clear at that point that you're moving from a section seven to a section six. Yes, which I felt was an appropriate thing to do. Yeah, it wasn't just a name change. No, no, that's right, exactly. So very much the, the whole thing was built around the concept of identifying HHAs mm -hmm. because I think it is a different process to, to um, identify special character. Okay, can I just, just, just make the, the point here? I, th I think that's, that's critical mm. in terms of the task that the council had. It had a positive obligation under Section 6 mm. to recognise and protect historic heritage in the city as opposed to a, a slightly less um, um, a direct obligation under Section 7 to have particular regard to amenity values. You know, one is much more directive. So if, if Council was was faced with the question of, well, what do we do? What, what, what's the priority here? Do we get out there and protect and recognise historic heritage? <coughs> or do we have particular regard to, to, to amenity? Of course it's going to be, we better make the focus recognition and protection of historic heritage. And that's basically what, what, what obviously ended up being the focus of the, the inquiry. So, um, rightly or wrongly, character has been left behind in the, in the, the approach on PC9. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, one of the conversations that we've had, of course, is that the approach taken has effectively stranded character, because we don't have that option on our table. If we found, for example, that one or more of the HHAs don't quite mm -hmm. make mustard, they don't actually fall naturally back into a character protection either. They fall into a vacuum. Well, well, yeah, but again, it, the, 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 I think the consequences of that need to be examined because that's a problem if you if you reject one of the current zoned heritage areas. Mm -hmm. If you were to say, for example, that Hayes Paddock, which is currently a zoned heritage area under the Operative District Plan, doesn't meet the criteria for heritage in the context of PC9, then you're right, it flips all the way down to, 
to, to nothing, basically. Mm. So that, that's a problem. Um, although, actually, you know, you're not changing the zoning in 9, it'll change in 12. But for those other areas that are being promoted as HHAs, which currently don't have any treatment, <coughs> no. in them, it just, it's status just the status quo. quo. Status quo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. Um, but we might actually, well, no, it doesn't matter because academic. We might think they deserve more, but we don't have any tools at all. You don't. You don't have the tools. If yeah. if you were to drop that to status quo, mm. um, that's it. That's, that's it. it. You don't have the ability to say no. We want to elevate it mm. one notch up, not two. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, that's right. That's our read too. So that's mm. good. Anything else? No, that's made it very clear. No. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. In that case, we're adjourned till nine o'clock tomorrow morning, and we will now do a site visit. So, thank you. Oh, and we have uh, copies of the maps. Thank you. Uh, Steve.